Hey guys, so before we start the video properly, uh, quick housekeeping announcement. This is going to be the last time in a long while that you see me with my hair like this because I'm getting a trim. Uh, this is going to all be going to Wigs for Kids, which is a charity that makes wigs for kids going through uh, chemo or they have uh, alopecia or going through things like that. Uh, I'm going to be doing a separate fundraising video for that. It would be great if you checked it out. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere and the Luscious Locks will return eventually, but I wanted to give the organization and the video the uh, a proper shout out so we can do as much good as possible. Anyway, on with the cringe. This book is an insult to the field of optometry. Does not want to stand up. The Aftermath Trilogy by Chuck Wendig is rather contentious. So back in 2012, Disney officially bought Star Wars as a property, and shortly after they started pumping out all sorts of new games and movies and, of course, books in order to invigorate the franchise and make a lot of money. I don't like this book. The success they've had is debatable because while they have made money, they haven't really put out a lot of good stories. The sequel trilogy is extremely contentious and if you want my opinion, I don't like it. What should have been an absolutely momentous return to a beloved franchise just broke down into two different directors battling each other over what kind of story they should be telling. Only instead of battling each other in the writer's room where it should have stayed, they actually put finished products out on screen that told uh, conflicting stories. Fuck it. Just start arguing in the comments. Now, I myself am a very casual Star Wars fan. I think Jedi are cool. I think the original trilogy are awesome. Prequel trilogy, not as much. And as far as TV series, nothing can top The Clone Wars by Gandhi Tartakovsky. That being said, I don't have a lot of investment in Star Wars, and there are certainly going to be references in this book that I do not catch. Now, I was always more of a Trekkie myself. Uh, I, I used to watch The Next Generation growing up with my dad. It was a good bonding experience. Uh, a lot of fun, good stories. Picard was an awesome captain. And Star Wars was fun, but I didn't have that same connection to it because of my father, so, you know. There's my bias. It's fun to wonder through. The alphabet with you to tell you what you mean to Endgame. But it is almost impossible to talk about this book without talking about the author, Chuck Windig. Now Chuck, according to him, got the job to write these books uh, because he asked for it on Twitter. Well, when I got hired for the job, um, which I got it from a tweet, I tweeted about wanting the job. Oh wow. Um, which is not normally how I recommend people try to get jobs, but it worked for me. Where he spends entirely too much time, I would argue. And people seem to like tearing him apart. Uh, for example, one infamous tweet of his that I retweeted uh, by criticizing it is something that apparently keeps coming back to haunt him every once in a while. Loads unpopular opinion shotgun. Tried to read Lord of the Rings a bunch and couldn't get through it. World building is not plot. Your book shouldn't read like an RPG manual, but should make me wish someone made your book into an RPG. The Chosen One is a tired narcissistic trope. Now, it's normally a waste of time to pause to analyze and overlook tweets because, you know, you're just sharing quick thoughts and, you know, you shouldn't really look too deeply into it. Mistakes are quite common. You don't need to go that far back to find mistakes in my own tweets. But Chuck professes himself a writer, and there is a certain degree of quality that one might expect, if not in the way that he writes tweets, the way that he puts his thoughts out. Now, if he says that he can't get through Lord of the Rings, okay, that's fine. It's not for everybody. Whatever. But world building is not plot. Yes, that's true, but that's not an opinion. Your book shouldn't read like an RPG manual. Okay, but Lord of the Rings doesn't. There are certainly sections that you can argue are uh, like an RPG manual. The descriptive, uh, descriptive passages 
when the characters run into different groups or stop at different towns. But the whole thing? No. And of course, the chosen one is a tired, narcissistic trope. I don't know where he's getting narcissistic, uh, unless the chosen one is supposed to be a self-insert for the author, but there is no chosen one in The Lord of the Rings. Thematically, it does exactly the opposite. I found it is the small things, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keeps the darkness at bay. Simple acts of kindness and love. For it was not a chosen one. There's no prophecy that says that he's destined for greatness. There's nothing that says that the One Ring must be destroyed by a very special hobbit or anything like that. It's he just volunteered on an incredibly dangerous mission. But I've seen some defense of this tweet by people claiming that uh, Chuck wasn't actually talking about Lord of the Rings. He's just putting a bunch of unpopular thoughts out there. And that's worse. The problem is, the first three of these points all seem to go hand in hand with each other, so one can safely assume that he's talking about Lord of the Rings for all of these. The fact that a writer can be so unclear about something like that. That is sad. I am sad. I mean, yeah, he's supposedly putting out a bunch of different opinions at once, but world building is not plot, is not an opinion. Those are actually different things. But bad tweets are not the only thing that Wendig is known for. He's also known for attacking the Internet Archives. The Internet Archives, uh, home to the Wayback Machine, as some of you may have uh, heard of, is a really good way to archive old information and create a lot of access for all sorts of people all over the world. It does much more good than bad, and I'm really rushing through this because there's a, there's a lot that I could say about it, but I don't want to waste too much time on it. Windig claimed that he didn't like what they were doing because they had all sorts of uh, copyrighted books on there as well. And while he claimed he didn't mind his own books being on the Internet Archives, he was fighting on behalf of other people. Yeah, that's not dehumanizing at all. It's not like other groups have their own agency and can speak on their own behalf. And as a result of Windig's involvement, at least in part, the Internet Archives were forced to close out their uh, section on copyrighted books, meaning there are all sorts of titles that people will not be able to read. And the way that it was utilized often is, is not a matter of piracy, it was more a matter of getting around certain copyright restrictions. Say you live in a country where uh, gay and lesbian characters are not allowed, and say a major character of your book happens to be gay. A person living in one of those countries wouldn't be able to read your book, wouldn't be able to buy your book, wouldn't be able to give you money. And so now, congratulations, not only have you not made a sale, you've actually restricted access so characters can't read about the gay character in your book. You phenomenal douchebag! Yeah, Wendig says that he's not doing this for money, and I absolutely call bullshit on that. The guy is greedy. Which makes it all the more appropriate that Wendig sounds very much like Wendigo a cannibalistic monster that eats people. And Wendig did offer a non-apology on his uh, website, which according to the link I've got up here says, I shouldn't have called it a pirate site, but I was otherwise fundamentally right about everything I said. Which as far as apologies go, is comparable to saying, I'm sorry you feel that way. But enough about talking about how Wendig is a bad person, let's talk about how he's a bad author. Now, Aftermath itself is set just after the events of Episode Six, The Return of the Jedi. The second Death Star is blown up, uh, Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader are dead, the Rebellion was a success, Luke Skywalker, Leia, Han, you know, all of them are hailed as heroes. But that doesn't mean the Empire has crumbled entirely. There's still, honestly, dozens of stories that you should be able to, to pull from that. It's not like a Metroid game where you kill the boss, the whole base blows up, and there's peace in the galaxy. This series, among others, gets rid of the established extended universe canon that Star Wars already had in place for it with other books, like Heir to the Empire by Timothy Zahn. And I am reading this one. It's actually pretty good. More on that later. No, this one was completely starting from scratch. You've got episodes one through six, and they've got a lead into episodes seven, eight, and nine. So let's just leave all of our thoughts about the sequel trilogy aside. Does this tell a good story? No! 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 
I mean, the tabs alone should tell you. I was so worried that I wouldn't actually have that much to say about this book. I was so worried that it was just going to be substandard and nothing else. But no, this turned into a freaking gold mine. The other books that I've reviewed in these long form videos, they've had a lot of basic mistakes from typos to setting errors to uh, continuity errors, magic systems that don't make sense. What Wendig does is he did advanced mistakes. There are so many new lessons I'll be able to teach you guys with just this book. Wendig is unironically the subtext is for cowards guy. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. Everything is surface level. They have these interlude chapters that are one of the most baffling writing decisions I've ever come across. I have my own theory on that, but we'll get to that later. You have to get to chapter eight before any of the dialogue sounds remotely human. I don't know what Chuck has a harder time with. Dialogue, prose, pacing. Windig strikes me as the type of guy who thinks that the second draft is for cleaning up a few typos and formatting, and then you're done and ready for publication. That is why you fail. Indie author Michael Lackman has stated that some of his books have taken a dozen drafts because sometimes that's just what it takes. And it's not even that exciting. Like, the story is much flatter than I expected. Like, regardless of what you think about the sequel trilogy, at least they gave us different places. Like, they, the story would take place in multiple different locations, on different starships, and different planets, some better than others, but that's a, an entirely different discussion. Aftermath takes place on the planet of Akiva in the town of Mira, and that's it. I mean, yes, you get the occasional uh, POV character on a spaceship somewhere, and then you've got the interlude chapters, but those are wholly irrelevant to the story. 80% of this story takes place in one town, on one planet. That doesn't feel like Star Wars. That feels like an absolute waste of potential. But what's the story? Can I sum it up in a in a single sentence? Yes. A loose contingent of impromptu rebels fuck up an imperial staff meeting. I'm not even joking. That's pretty much it. The Empire is having an emergency meeting on Akiva, and you've got a couple of people who aren't really rebels, but just kind of decide, eh, let's screw the Empire, let's, let's mess with them. But disappointing set pieces and minimal story are hardly the worst crimes that this book commits. Let me show you. One of the few things that I can actually say the book got right is that it opens with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. The book opens with a prelude, a letter written by Admiral Akbar, the Mon Calamari hero from uh, Return of the Jedi, better known with this clip. It's a trap! He writes a general letter to the Rebellion and the galaxy at large saying that Commander Skywalker has confirmed Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader are dead. And this is fine, it's really just catching the reader up as part of the larger canon as the events of Episode 6 have concluded and the story's continuing on from there. That's, you know, good. Except he ends the letter with this. We must remember that our fight continues. Our rebellion is over. But the war, the war is just beginning. You've been fighting for a while. I don't think you can say that. I mean, aside from the blatant use of a shameless cliche that doesn't fit, you can say the fight continues, that's true, but the war is just beginning, dude. But war, war never changes. The first chapter is set on Coruscant, and it's just after news of the second Death Star's explosion has hit. People are, you know, in the streets, fighting back against uh, stormtroopers, tearing down statues of Emperor Palpatine. Appropriate enough image, it makes sense. You know, regime change and all that. And among the rioting crowd fighting back against the stormtroopers, we get Rorak and Jack. Two of those gathered, a father and son, Rorak and Jack. Quick duck behind the collapsed statue. The sounds of the battle unfolding right here in Monument Plaza don't end. In the distance, the sound of more fighting, a plume of flames, flashes of blaster fire. A billboard high up in the sky among the traffic lanes suddenly goes to static. Now, one of the problems with this book that I don't like is that it's all written in present tense, which sounds really weird for a story that was set a long time ago. 
present tense is one of those writing styles that I'm not crazy about because very often it's not utilized properly. It's trendy. Uh, Hunger Games started using it and it seems to have exploded somewhat from that. And people have attempted to use present tense more as a way to stand out stylistically rather than to actually deepen any sort of an image or emotional ties within the story at large. You see, here's the problem. Suzanne Collins, who wrote The Hunger Games, actually understood how you could use present tense well, artistically. If the story is set in present tense, then it sounds like the events are happening just then. They are currently unfolding as you're reading them. It really does a good job of putting the reader in place alongside the characters. When Katniss first started The Hunger Games, when, you know, the events actually started undergoing, she was in a constant sense of danger. And the present tense writing style applied that danger so that it felt like anything could happen to her at any time, and the book utilized that well. That does not happen with Aftermath. There is no reason why this can't be done in past tense. Honestly, that would have been much better. Right now, it sounds like Chuck is just trying to stand out as a writer. There's no reason for him to be doing this. It's just a way to amplify himself. Keep that in mind as we go through, because so many of the, the lines that I'm going to pull from this book don't sound better because they're present tense. So much of it doesn't depend on the reader being in that moment with the characters. The way that Wendig wrote his story, if he did use past tense, it would actually have a stronger impact because it would sound like something more fatal was happening to his characters. And that is not the last time I'm going to talk about Wendig's writing style. The entire chapter is really short, like barely two full pages. And what it's building up to is this last moment involving the characters whose names I already forgot. Rorak and Jack, by using them as emotional crutches to show how this is affecting, you know, your everyday family man and children. For a long time, he's told his son not the truth, but the idealized hope. One day the Empire will fall and things will be different for when you have children. And that may still come to pass, but now a stronger, sharper truth is required. Jack, the battle isn't over. The battle is just starting. Again, we get this idea that the war has just started, but the same thing was repeated by Akbar four pages ago. What are you doing, Wendig? I am going to be very loud in this review. So, Wendig broke his story into four parts. I don't know why. There's no real act structure that it follows. Like, I just went back to double check where parts two and three pick up. There is a part four, but that's really just an extended epilogue slash resolution and yeah like there's no real thematic reason to break it up the way that he did it's by a very loose definition can you call it a three-act structure but not really like you'd have just as easy time arguing against that idea as you would for it you'll see more of that as we go on anyway we open up with the most descriptive of intros you know how sometimes books will say uh chicago 1985 or something just to let you know the time place well Wendig does us one better. Now, I'm being facetious because he opened up the Coruscant chapter with then, but do better, please. And he never uses place setting like that ever again throughout the rest of the book, so it just sounds tacked on. Well, the story actually continues as we arrive already at the planet Akiva, a small planet with striations of brown and green, thick white clouds swirling over its surface. Okay, doesn't sound like an entirely unwelcome planet in a uh, series with famous desert planets. And we get Wedge Antilles, once known as Red Leader. All right, Wedge, go for the power regulator on the North Tower. Copy, Gold Leader. I'm already on my way out. Fan favorite involved in all sorts of raids against the Empire. Okay, good character. I really look forward to seeing the many adventures of Wedge Antilles in this book. So Wedge is flying around looking for any sign of Empire activity, because, you know, they're not all dead, and the Rebellion's got to fight, or rather the New Republic, as the Rebellion has been morphing itself into a legitimate 
organization, uh, government. They've got to try to find the remnants of the empire and bring them to the justice. And that's what he's looking for. And this actually brings up a good example of one of the other problems of writing in present tense. Today it's quiet. Wedge likes the quiet. He pulls up his data pad, scrolls through the list with a tap of the button on the side. He has to hit it a few times just to get it to go. If there's one thing he looks forward to when this is all over, it's that maybe they'll start to get new tech. Somehow, this data pad had actual sand in it, and that's why the buttons stick. The list of planets clicks past. The way that Wendig utilizes present tense almost requires that his characters focus on banal topics and descriptions. Like, I don't care if the button sticks on his data pad. It doesn't lead to anything. It doesn't doom him in any way. It doesn't come up again. Why do I need to know that his data pad has sand in it? I don't like sand. And then there's the other problem with his narration. He's been to, let's see, five so far. Now, Narrative voice is something that a lot of people struggle with. The narrator is effectively a character, and there are all sorts of ways you can do it. Like first-person narration, I, that's obvious. The narrator is literally a character telling things from their perspective. But in third person, like this book is, you need to consider the narrator as kind of the objective voice of what's going on. So if the narrator comes in and says, oh, let's see, he's been doing da -da 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 -da, that doesn't sound professional. It doesn't sound objective. It sounds like the narrator is playing catch up and that's not a good look. But as Wedge flies around Akiva, he notices two Star Destroyers that start flying in orbit over the planet. New dilemma though, what now? Fly down to the planet to do aerial recon, as was the original plan, or plot a course back to Chandrilla. Something's up. Two Star Destroyers appearing out of nowhere? Blocked comms? That's not nothing. It means I've found what I'm looking for. The thought process that goes on in this moment. A communications disruption can mean only one thing. Invasion. Now sometimes the narrative voice, even in third person, can serve as an extension of the thoughts of the point of view character that's uh, being discussed. The problem is, the two Star Destroyers is probably enough activity that it warrants investigation by a larger fleet, not just one dude flying around in a light cargo ship or something. Uh, HH-87 Starhopper. But to have the line given the way that it is, something's up, two Star Destroyers blocked comms, that's not nothing, it sounds like Wedge is slow on the uptake. No. They called you slow! How dare you call me that! I... Hey homie, you still here? Boy, you are slow! And it sounds especially unnecessary when it follows up with Wedge literally thinking it means I've found what I'm looking for. Well, the Star Destroyers hail him. Uh, Wedge comes up with a story that he's just transporting light cargo. No big deal, nothing worth investigation. And then we get this passage. A different voice comes through the tinny speaker. A woman's voice. Got some steel in it, less crisp, nothing lilting. This is someone with some authority, or at least someone who thinks she possesses it. She says, Gev Hessen, pilot number 45236. We get a full description of her voice before we hear her voice, so there's no chance for the character to establish itself. Now, this is something that you could call front loading. Effectively, Wendig is telling you how you're supposed to think about this voice as opposed to leading you to it. This is, in fact, a variation of show don't tell. If Wendig wanted to do this right, he should have had this female character speak authoritatively to uh, Wedge, actually have some degree of aggression in her voice. But either because he doesn't understand writing or he doesn't trust his readers, he has to set things up so they know exactly what's going on, which leads less room for imagination for the reader, which gives less investment for the reader. You don't want to force your readers along the situation. You don't want to demand that they picture things in an exactly certain way. Lead them along just enough so they get a general idea and can explore that room, that spaceship, those characters, those voices, enough in their own way. It just feels like a lot of people have forgotten the reason that the book was better was just a cliche saying was because 
when people used to read books, they would visualize these things on their own, and the, the movie that played in their head as they read wasn't as good as what was projected on the movie screen. Wendig is doing the opposite, and he's taking the imagination away from the reader, so there's less fun for us. And in a series as vibrant and varied as Star Wars, that's absolutely a crime. Well, the person on the other end of that line was actually Admiral Ray Sloan, who is a canonical character from previous works that I've never read. I haven't read any of the Extended Universe books. I've read a few comics. They were pretty good, especially the ones around Darth Vader. Darth Vader, lay down your weapons. You are surrounded. All I am surrounded by is fear and dead men. Well, Admiral Sloan is not a stupid character. She decides that she doesn't know who this person in the Starhopper is, so they're just gonna throw a tracking beam on him and pull him into the ship for interrogation, just in case. Wedge doesn't know what he's going to do, so he blows up the ship. Admiral Sloan thinks herself as they're pulling Wedge's ship in. These will do, though, for now. Ahead is the Starhopper, drifting in through the void of space, cradled by the invisible grip of the tractor beam. Down past the lineup of TIE fighters, half of what they need, a third of what she'd prefer, drifting slowly toward the gathered stormtroopers. They have the numbers. The Starhopper will have one pilot, most likely, perhaps a second or third crew member. It drifts closer and closer. She wonders, who are you? Who is inside that little tin can? Then, a bright flash and a shudder. The Starhopper suddenly glows blue from the nose end forward. It explodes in a rain of fire and scrap. So, yeah. So we're clear. Wedge's ship exploded in space. I don't know how he lived. Here's the thing. That's not the only time that happens. Like. There, there are these moments where I'm reading them and I'm like, okay, okay, what are you leading to? And, and you never really get an answer. It gets infuriating later. A really big fucking hole coming right up. Somehow, despite force fields being a thing, there are, are a number of injured stormtroopers in the uh, landing pad. And they assume that it's, you know, a suicide attack, maximize the damage. And Sloan insists, no, he's here. He can't be far. It's like... He blew up in space! How could he get inside the ship without you knowing? In the chaos, did he jump onto a TIE fighter that no one saw? What would happen if he missed? These questions will be answered never! Well, that plot point ends, and we get a new character in a new chapter, Nora, who, for some reason, goes by her maiden name beforehand, uh, Nora Susser, but she's on her way to Akiva, her home. Now that I'm home, I'm going by my married name again. Wexley. That doesn't sound robotic at all. The reason why she went by her maiden name and not her married name will never be explained. Set that to the pile of mysteries with no answers. Now, Nora is a something of a retconned character, but it's retconned in a way that doesn't actually hurt anything. Disney Star Wars has changed a few things up, often for the worse, and... It's good to see it actually done in a way that actually works without sacrificing anything. Nora was one of the Y-Wing pilots that actually went into the second Death Star during Return of the Jedi. Here goes nothing. Okay, you're taking an otherwise faceless side character and giving her a personality, fleshing her out a little bit. I think that's a perfectly serviceable idea. And throughout the story, she's fine as a character. She's she's not the best, but she's definitely not the worst. Although she is wearing more plot armor than anyone else you will see as we go on. Anyway, she's flying to Akiva so that she can rendezvous with her son, the son that she had to leave behind so that she could go fight with the Rebellion several years ago. And she's flying with a, another pilot, basically being used as a taxi service named Owerto. I don't know if he's important because after this chapter, he's pretty much gone for the rest of the story. I bring that up because he's got this, just this line. It's really indicative of the kind of dialogue and writing we're gonna get for the rest of the story. You know why I call this ship the moth? 
I don't. You ever try to catch a moth? Cup your hands, chase after it, catch it? White moth, brown moth, any moth at all? You can't do it. They always get away. Herky-jerky, up and down, left and right. Like a puppet dancing on someone's strings. That's me. That's this ship. This dialogue is terrible. Something that I noticed really early on with Wendig's writing is that his dialogue, for the most part, is robotic, at least for the first several chapters. Whenever it's in any kind of sizable paragraph, like if it's if it takes up more than four lines on the page, it's some sort of awkwardly wedged in exposition dump. There are examples of that later on. It's just, oof. Now, if Chuck wants to try to implement herky-jerky as some sort of a signature element of his writing style, that's weird, because it's not the only time he utilizes that. But if you're going to have any kind of a signature phrase or something, you've got to be careful with it. First off, it helps if it doesn't sound like it's written for five-year-olds. Second, you have to associate it with uh, a character or a situation, have it actually latch onto something meaningful, otherwise it gets latched onto the author, and in a situation like this, it sounds stupid. Bringing back Abercrombie, one of the characters, Logan Ninefingers, is a barbarian who has several phrases associated with him. You have to be realistic about these sorts of things, you can't, you can never have too many knives, or the ever dramatic, still alive, I'm still alive. Again, please read this book. As she's writing along in The Moth, Nora thinks back to her old days as a rebel pilot, how she started out as a uh, cargo pilot, you know, just carrying messages and supplies and stuff, and eventually got recruited by uh, Wedge as a fighter pilot to eventually where she was flying against the second Death Star. Well, as that's going on, the and they approach Akiva, the Star Destroyers in orbit notice the moth and try to open fire against it. And we get this ever so ridiculous tryhard line as the pilot of the moth tells Nora to get on a, a gunner so that they can, you know, take down some of the, or get on a uh, gunnery position so they can take down the TIE fighters that are pursuing them. I'm not a gunner, she says. I'm a pilot! She throws the pilot out of the seat, takes control herself, and she pulls back on the stick. The moth ceases its dive towards the planet's surface. The lasers just miss, passing under the hind end of the freighter, continuing on. Boom! They take out two of the TIE fighters that had been following close behind. And even as she continues hauling back on the stick, her stomach and heart trading places, the blood roaring in her ears, she loop-de-loops the ship just in time to see the remaining two ties clip each other. You know, it's ridiculous because there are going to be a multitude of lines that I cite from this book that sound like that, that sound like they're written for children, but the material and format of the book are definitely not written for children, so it really makes me wonder who the hell is Chuck writing this for? That's not even the worst example I can cite. But Nora escapes and we cut back to Sloan as she recites some exposition for a lieutenant so that the reader knows what's going on. Soon the others will arrive. I cannot have this be a time that demonstrates my weakness. We cannot reveal an inability to control our own environment because if that happens, it will prove, particularly to Pandian, that we cannot even control this meeting. And this meeting must be controlled. Dr. Rosenblatt, four play in room seven, please. Dr. Rosenblatt. Like I said, anytime dialogue comes in the form of a paragraph, I assume that it's just expository. But it's written this way because Chuck has no faith in his readers. I, that's how I'm taking it here. He has to lay out everything as simplistically as possible even if it doesn't sound like realistic dialogue. There are tons of ways that you can fit exposition in dialogue like this. It just helps if it sounds like it's coming from actual people. What ho, fellow humans? Are you enjoying having skin today? New chapter, we finally get to the city of Mira on Akiva, where we meet a uh, former Imperial loyalty officer, Shinjir Rath Velas. I'm an idiot. Shinjir is hiding out from the Imperials in a bar, just drinking his sorrows away because 
He's got a uh, an unfortunate past. Uh, he was on Endor when the second Death Star exploded. Saw that going down, figured, hey, I guess I'm out of a job, and pretty much abandoned his post. Sinjir tries ordering a drink from the bartender, who is a Mon Calamari, and we get this line. I'll take, by all the stars and all the skies, it's hot, isn't it? So if you're going to have a character say something uh, off-handed and short like that is a very simple rule to follow. Quips should be quippy. Chuck doesn't know the difference between a quip and an essay. When you take a line like that, by all the stars and all the skies, it's hot, isn't it? You draw it out and it doesn't sound good. It becomes uncomfortable to the ear, kind of like watching somebody slice a cake wrong. And if that's not bad enough, I didn't know this when I started uh, taking notes, but there is a, an awful lot of stupid, unnecessary star and space references made in this book. Now, yes, this series is called Star Wars. There's a lot of space stuff that goes on, but I don't recall anybody actually unnecessarily throwing out a line like, by all the stars and all the skies, I'm certainly thirsty. First off, because it sounds stupid. Second off, because it just sounds unnecessary. It's like Chuck was afraid we'd forget that this takes place in space or something. And this line, like this type of line, gets repeated nauseatingly often throughout the book. I was going to do this reference every time I read one of those lines. We get it, you're from space! The problem is, if I actually carried through with it, I would use it so many times, you'd get sick of the reference. So, I'm just going to do all of the references at once in a big mosaic, so you guys can get an idea of how often this happens. No, my space bomb! Ah! My space space armor! We get it, you're from space! As he's drowning his sorrows, Sinjir is confronted by uh, an alien called a Twi'lek. Don't hate me if I'm mispronouncing these. I don't watch Star Wars stuff. Anyway, this guy asks Sinjir if he's seen the Holovid. And that is despite Sinjir giving no indication that he's there to talk. You seen the Holovid? The Twi'lek asks, indicating that he's one of those brash, belligerent types who only understand social cues when they're delivered at the end of a fist or at the tip of a rifle, a blaster rifle. Now, one of Chuck's other big problems is that he is entirely too wordy. Passages like this are just go on too long and they sound awkward. Less is more is a rule that I have emphasized in a number of times. It comes down to, a, a subset of that would be like uh, minimum words, maximum impact. What you wanna do is you wanna get your point across using the fewest but strongest words that you can in order to maximize the emotions. The best example I can think of is from Ernest Hemingway's six word uh, challenge. Like a, the story behind it is that Hemingway was challenged to write the saddest story possible in as few words, and he did it with for sale, baby shoes, never worn. And that's all you need to get that really depressing image in your head. Chuck instead just beats you over the head with as many words because more words is gooder words. We then get another waste of time as the Twi'lek pulls out this holovid of uh, Leo Organa giving a speech about how, you know, the Empire has fallen, Palpatine is dead, and we're gonna start rebuilding. And this is information that's already been conveyed to the reader up to this point. So this section is largely irrelevant as far as the reader is concerned. And because Sinjir doesn't react to it very much, it's useless to him. He doesn't give a reaction, it doesn't call him to action later on. He actually gets involved in the story for entirely different reasons. So this is just compounding information, basically overloading the reader to make sure, absolutely sure, that they got the idea that Chuck wanted to get across. If the reader's familiar with the situation, you don't need to beat it over their head, which is why if you 
see an adventure through a character's perspective and they have to recount things, usually what happens is you don't have them sit down and actually explain everything verbatim. You get a quick cutaway. Uh, Bob explained his misadventures at the deli that evening. Come on. For some reason, a fight breaks out in the bar and Sinjir gets involved and we get this passage and I'm not being critical but it is going to lead to something else. Sinjir dissects the man's defenses. Hand under wrist. Pistol launches up, fires toward the ceiling. Dust streaming down on their heads. He stabs out with a boot, catching the man in the shin, knee, upper thigh. The Imperial's thick body crumbles like a table with its leg broken, but Sinjir won't let him fall. He folds him up by the wrist and with his free hand strikes at vulnerable points. Nose, eye, windpipe, bread basket. Then back to the nose, where he hooks the oaf's nostrils with a pair of cruel fingers, forcing him to the ground. The man weeps and blubbers and bleeds. Now this reminds me of something of a scene from Monument 14. Uh, you know, fun little dystopian uh, YA book I read a while ago. It was, it was enjoyable. Um, there's a scene where the main character goes a little berserk. There's something got sprayed in the air and now... Yeah, you know, if you inhale too much of this chemical, you go crazy. I'm simplifying it drastically for the sake of time here, but... The protagonist grabs a chainsaw to protect one of his friends who's being attacked by this guy, and you don't get a full description of the chainsaw as it's tearing through this attacker's flesh. Instead, it just goes shoulder, chest, hips. And, I mean, that alone does a great job of exemplifying what's actually happening. To an extent, that's what it feels like Chuck is aiming for, except it's not as vivid an image. It's like saying, uh, Bob then poked the guy in the eyes, poke, poke. But honestly, this is one of Chuck's better action scenes, and that is something of a problem. One of the other things that Chuck's writing style is famous for, oh my god, how can one man make so many mistakes, is his frequent use of sentence fragments. Now, there are all sorts of ways that you can create an individual writing style, and what you'd really want to do is know how to get the mood and the emotion out of the scene most effectively. And sentence fragments can be a very good way to do that in action scenes. And a very, very bad way to do that in casual dialogue scenes. Chuck's problem with action scenes is that he doesn't know how to actually ground the reader in the moment and get them invested in what's going on. It's bad enough that his characters are at best, kind of likable, but because there's no real uh, description that we can sink our teeth into, because the story just gets tedious the longer it goes on, we're not invested in the fight scenes. We don't think the characters are actually in danger. The stakes don't really seem that high. There, there's a whole series of messes, and this entire fight scene actually becomes something of a problem for the character, and a problem for the way these other characters are introduced later on, but we'll get to that later. And then we get this stupid chunk of dialogue as uh, Sinjir grabs one of the uh, Imperials that was involved in the fight and asks them what the hell is going on. Wonderful thing about the nose is how it's tied to all these sensitive nerve endings behind the face. This fleshy protuberance, yours like a hog snout, if I'm being honest, is why, right now, your head is filling with mucus and your eyes are filling with tears. We then get what is the first in many, many, many interlude chapters. And these are baffling. Now, it took me a while to really figure out what was going on with them. And I, I might as well just get this out of the way. What Chuck will do every once in a while, every two, three, four chapters, is he'll cut away to some random planet. Uh, this first one is Chandrilla, which I'm not familiar with. It deals with like some broadcaster, uh, like there's this character, Olia Choco, and some other character named Tracine Kane. And like they're giving a basic report on like how the new Republic is forming. It's like, 
it really doesn't have anything to do with the story at large. What Chuck is doing is he's introducing these tertiary, honestly, they're not even good enough to call tertiary characters. At first, what I thought he was trying to do is introduce these side characters and these different worlds so that he can bring them into the story later, which was a problem because there are like six or seven point of view characters in this book that are related to the story. These interlude chapters will go on for less than 10 pages. I don't think a single one goes beyond eight. You'll get a snapshot of what's going on with these characters or on this planet, and then you go back to the story. It is a distraction. It doesn't serve the story at large. It completely takes you out of the moment every time. It's like the story is on pause. So you could have some random ass intermission that doesn't have anything to do with anything. They're not really entertaining. I didn't find them entertaining at least. They don't really inform you that much. I had to look up every single character because I didn't know who they were. That just added on time that I could have been spent going through and just finishing the book. It was homework. These, these chapters are homework because I didn't have context for who these characters are, but I think I know why they're in there. And I didn't really figure that out until I got to one of the characters like named Vanth Cobb. And I got that backwards, Cobb Vanth. So Mr. Corn Cobb is actually the sheriff character from the second season of Mandalorian. He's the sheriff who was wearing Boba Fett's armor on some small nowhere town on Tatooine and never impacts the actual story of Aftermath. I think part of the, re and I have not been able to find anything that confirms this, so this is purely my own headcanon, but it feels like the reason it was written that way was because Disney gave Chuck a list of characters and events that they wanted to have happen in the story. And he couldn't think of a way to make them actually work. So what you get instead is this, the, these random ass nothings that don't have anything to do with anything. They're just casual references so that Disney can utilize them later on in later franchises. What made you decide that, that that's the way that you wanted to write the, the first, the second, and I don't know, maybe the, I assume the third's going to do the same thing. Was that third, something? Yeah, third, yeah. Was, was that something that that was that was your style that you pitched, or was that something that Del Rey um, had pitched that they would like you to try as well? Like, you know, if you're familiar with the novel World War Z, then not a movie come out. Yeah, World War Z is nothing like the movie, and that the World War Z is basically just snapshots from this "quote unquote" zombie war. Um, and so, like, what if we did that? What if we told the story of the galaxy through? you know, one to three books of these snapshots. And I was like, that's, you know, it's cool. But at the same time, so I was like, well, what if we did a little bit of that? What if we had, we dropped out of the chapters every, you know, three, four chapters. And we said, well, let's, because, you know, if we're going to look at the galaxy, we're going to look at things like, you know, media or politics or the criminal underworld. Like if this story is a small one and we knew the, the Akiva story was a small one, the interludes give us a chance to blow that open a little more and just sort of give us pinhole looks at the rest of the galaxy. Oh. Yeah, the great thing too about the interludes is there's, they're not entirely essential, so you can kind of read them however you want to. Um, they're terrible, they're pointless, and considering how many of the characters I had to look up don't actually have real entries in, like, Wikipedia, I don't think that your more advanced Star Wars fans would really appreciate these interruptions. A good number of these characters, like, their first appearance is this book. How am I supposed to get invested in a less than tertiary character who doesn't impact anything? Why are they there? Absolute waste of time. Not unlike the rest of the book. Something else that bothered me about the interlude characters is that it's still possible to use tertiary characters and give you just enough to make you care about them. For example, Steve Alton's The Meg series. Now, Alton is a guilty pleasure author of mine. The, the Meg series, unfortunately, just falls in terms of quality throughout the books. I actually didn't finish book six, but whatever. Something that Alton actually does pretty well is he's able to introduce tertiary characters into the story at random intervals and give you just enough information to make you care about whether or not they 
live or die. And what makes them work, aside from decent setup, is that they are actually attached to what's going on in the plot. What Alden does is he will set up some math teacher who's on vacation and estranged from his wife or something, and, you know, just trying to get away from his troubles when all of a sudden, like, the giant shark that's on the loose, like, comes too close to his boat and, and it's a question of, oh my god, this poor man, is he going to survive? Sometimes they don't, and sometimes that's really tragic. But it shows you how other people in the world are affected by the plot and the actions of the protagonists. It's a good way to give you a larger image of what's happening in the story. It's not just what happens around a few central characters. Other people, random innocents, are impacted too, and I think that's a really smart choice. I mean, aside from the fact that Alden actually does a decent job introducing them and getting you to worry about uh, the people, because they, they sound like decent folk. The interlude characters aren't attached to anything that's going on in the story, so their involvement is useless. A little worse than useless, actually. As far as the story goes, they're non-entities. And I've seen people, like, praise them before, like, oh, well, I like how you included Jar Jar in the second book, and, uh, yeah, it's good to see what he's been up to after those times. It's like, why is it there? How does it serve the story? How does it serve the characters the story is about? What you're giving me is a shallow, meaningless side quest. You can skip all the interlude chapters, at least in the first book, and you will miss nothing in regards to the story in that book, at least. Maybe you'll miss some sort of a, a, a neat cameo, like Cobb Vanth getting his Mandalorian armor. And outside of that one example, I don't know if any of the other interlude chapters actually lead to anything ever. Really sad state of affairs. All right, new chapter, new character. We get Temin Wexley, who is Nora Wexley's son. He lives on Akiva, runs a junk shop where he sells all sorts of things to all sorts of people and has a pretty firm understanding of all things mechanical to the point where it really raises questions, especially because he's a teenager. Now, something interesting I found out is that Temin is actually not just canon because Disney canon and all, uh, he actually does make an appearance in the Star Wars movies. He actually goes by the nickname Snap and was involved in uh, the climax in Episode 9. Snap, they're on your tail! Yeah, I see it! No, 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 Snap! Snap! Oh, no! As far as I can tell, that's Snap's only inclusion in the Disney sequel trilogy and I can't tell if it's supposed to be a meaningful homage or a terrible insult. Anyway, Temin is playing a, a game of Space Catan, as it seems to be described, called Galactic Expansion against one of his droids. When a couple of thugs run in, uh, they work for the local gang lord, some guy named Surat, and they start threatening him because they think that Temin stole some of Surat's property. Cut the rancor spit, you little puke! A man was paid to write this. Viceroy, I don't want this stunted slime in my sight again. Well, the thugs start interrogating Temin and they ask, Think hard about what happened on the Trasbon Road. Does that tickle your brain stem? I was so sure I was gonna run out of tabs to mark stupid dialogue. I had to open up like three packs. Well, Timon starts snapping his fingers, which is a nervous habit he picked up from his father. And that's a good thing. Giving your characters little ticks like that can, you know, establish them as characters, can, in this case, bring them a little closer to other characters, you know, relation-wise. The problem is, if you're going to establish a nervous tick like that, you have to actually carry through and make sure that it happens for the rest of the book. I can't recall him ever doing this ever again. Don't set something like this up for your characters and then never have them do it again. It's like if a character starts a book by decrying how much they hate ice cream and then multiple times throughout the rest of the book, they're casually eating ice cream. So Temin pretty much admits that, yes, he did in fact steal a package that was meant for Surat. 
Uh, he hasn't been able to open it yet, and that will come up later. But they, the thugs demand that he go down, get the package, and bring it up to them. And he knows, you know, Temin knows that they're probably just going to kill him anyway because he insulted a gang lord. So what he does is he powers up a B-1 battle droid, you know, the weird-looking scarecrow things from the prequel trilogy. Where'd they go? Whoa. Only, this one's an incredible badass named Mr. Bones, and all kidding aside, Mr. Bones is far and away the best thing about this book. You'll see why later. Mr. Bones then starts destroying the bad guys, though the description is not very clear. Mr. Bones cackles, a scratchy, warped laugh from his speakers, as his one hand swings free on a hinge. From the hole springs a sparking, vibrating blade, the Ithorian, is slow to react, and by the time Herf is bringing up his DLT cannon, Bones has whipped his arm back three times already, and the cannon is whittled down, three smolder smoldering bits clattering to the floor. The problem with the way that these characters are all being introduced, uh, you'll notice this happened with Wedge, Nora, Temin, and uh, Sinjir, is they're all being introduced in exactly the same way. Here's the character, here's the bad situation, here's the character being a badass to get out of it. Now, right above me is my Michael Crichton collection, and I'm just pulling out Jurassic Park as an example. The way that Crichton wrote was somewhat formulaic. A lot of his books introduced characters in similar veins between books. You would have all these different characters doing all these different things, and eventually they would meet up, and the plot would really start. Talk about formulas all you want there, the difference being the characters were memorable when Crichton did it. He actually knew how to bring people in. He would have them doing something, displaying some sort of expertise, uh, explaining something, displaying character, so that when everyone met up for the plot to actually start, you had a solid idea about who all these people were. They were all different, and even though the events are technically different, because Sinjir fought one way, uh, Temin fought another way, Nora was just a pilot, and you know, all that, you know, they're different, but those are cosmetic differences. The substances of what's actually occurring is all the same. You know, really cheap, oh, my OC is so badass moments. It, it really comes off as repetitive after a while. When Crichton did it, you would have scientists, engineers, soldiers, lawyers more times than not. And not only did it distinguish all these characters as individuals, it did them in entertaining ways that all made them stand out. So they were actually impactful later on in the story. Wendig has not learned how to do this. Mr. Bones takes care of the thugs as Temin tries to run, but it turns out one of the visitors is not a thug, it's actually his mother, Nora, coming by to see her baby boy. But then we cut back to see how Wedge is doing. No, we don't know how he got onto the Star Destroyer, but somehow he's there. I guess teleporting is now canon in Star Wars. Find me a better explanation. But Wedge realizes that more important than his own survival is reaching out to the New Republic to let them know that the Empire has made an appearance on Akiva. So he goes straight for the comms room. Sensible. What's not sensible is how apparently he feels about comms officers and pilots. And so now he stands in the communications room. The bodies of three comms officers lie nearby. One slumped over her station, another two dropped on the floor. Stunned, not dead. Wedge isn't a killer. He's a pilot, and taking down other pilots means ending the lives of combatants. Comms officers aren't soldiers, aren't pilots, they're just people. Does that mean that pilots are not people? I'd make further jokes about that, except I don't want an Air Force officer carpet bombing my house. And as he's flipping through uh, various channels to reach out to the New Republic, the book includes a typo. There, none of the known Republic channels is blocked. That's not grammatically correct, you insolent fucko. Should have done a third draft, Chuck. But before he can reach anyone in the New Republic, Wedge is ambushed by Sloane in a very stale action scene. 
He cries out in pain as a laser bolt burns a hole through his shoulder. His hand reflexively opens. The microphone clatters away. He paws at his hip for his own blaster, but another shot and the weapon that hung there is quickly spun to slag and knocked off his belt. Not only do all the sentences begin the same, he, his, he, the actions are very literal. There's no real grace or art to how the images are being depicted. Uh, metaphors and similes are great tools that you can use to try to add a little bit of spice to your action scenes. But the insults to the character really kick in as Wedge begs for his life on the next page. Please, he says, clutching his shoulder, favoring his leg. Wait, let's talk this out, he swallows hard, wincing. It's over. You know it's over. We can negotiate a surrender, a meaningful surrender. Right here, right now, you and I can. Now I'll admit, I don't know too much about Wedge as a character, but that doesn't really sound very heroic. I don't know if it's against what he does or does in other uh, stories, but not terribly appealing, I don't think. You know, it doesn't stand up in defiance or insult uh, Sloane's the one who shot him. Uh, and instead, he just basically folds and begs. Ha! Yes! Like a bitch! We cut back to Tamin and Nora as they're going deeper into Tamin's shop. He's got a secret uh, basement level for storage and all. And he points out that time matters. Those thugs who were here, eventually they're gonna wake up and crawl back to their boss. Confirming that the thugs are not dead, because, you know, Star Wars, if anything, is completely devoid of violence. Do it. And then he and Nora have a very meaningful talk because it turns out that Nora effectively abandoned Tamin because his father, her husband, had been abducted by stormtroopers. She joined the rebellion in order to try to get him back, but in all her time fighting, wasn't able to find him. This means that Tamin was not quite an orphan, like he was sent to go live with his aunt who is in the city somewhere, but it's something that Temin holds very spitefully and doesn't really appreciate his mother's intentions. I'm my own man. Other kids had parents, but I didn't. I had a mom who flew the coop. Months without hearing from you each time. I had to make do, so I did. Now, I'm a businessman, and I need to keep my business safe. You made your choice. Between me and the galaxy, you chose the galaxy, so don't pretend like I matter now. And I point this out because it's going to be very important later on in the story. Chuck set himself up with something really promising and absolutely bungled it. Another interlude with some family, Glenn, Dav, and Webb at the Tafril house. And during this, we get a Wendig dialogue trifecta. The brothers start arguing when the father cuts in. Shut up, both of you. You two are in dire need of a lesson. I'm an old man. Had the two of you later than I would have liked. Figured myself a single man, a simple farmer, until your mother came along. May all the stars welcome her soul. So it's great. It sounds stupid, it forces exposition, and it includes needless space references. And the brothers are fighting over like who's better, the empire or the rebellion, and the father cuts in with, now listen. What's come before will come back around again. Republic was the way of the world before, and it'll be the way again. And for a time, everyone will cheer them on, and everything will be cozy-dozy. It's really difficult to believe that this wasn't written for kindergartners. And the, the father, like, scolds both of his kids for picking sides in this battle, but it turns out that one brother betrayed the other to the Empire, and so the father picks a side in the battle and shoots the other kid with a stun blast. Great, great lessons. All on the same page, too. And then we get another new character, Jazz Emari. Uh, she's a Zabrak, the uh, Darth Maul uh, kind of alien, and a bounty hunter. And out of all of the groups, like all the different people in this book, 
Jazz was the one that I was looking forward to the most because take the Jedi. They've they've all got uh, incredible powers, lightsabers, you know, cool characters and all, but you know, they've got magic on their side. Uh, you've got the Empire that has infrastructure and military strength. You've got the Rebellions that have lesser military strength, arguably, but uh, really ruthless tactics. But they also have a lot of teammates and, you know, the, the spark of hope in the galaxy or whatever. Bounty Hunters in Star Wars are unique because they've got to rely on just themselves and their equipment. It's, it's more fun, in my opinion, to have Bounty Hunters that have to go and solve problems with minimal resources and and uh, overcome incredible odds. It's part of the reason why I liked The Mandalorian, at least bits and pieces of it. And Jazz does function a little bit on her own, but then eventually becomes part of a team, loses that individual dynamic, and doesn't really do much for the rest of the book. Absolute wasted potential. The one thing that she does have that's really impressive that, again, is massively underutilized in this book is her gun. She unbuckles the rifle from her back, a long-range rifle the Zabrak constructed herself. Based on an old Sherza slug thrower, she modified it to fire rounds according to her, uh, to her needs, depending upon which barrel and which chamber she brings to the weapon. Jazz once heard the story that the Jedi constructed their own lightsabers, and she figured, well, why can't she do the same with her rifle? So she did, because she can do whatever she wants. Her gun is basically the one from Jack and Daxter 2. It also sounds like she'd have to completely reconstruct the gun because that's not how chambers and barrels work, but I don't know. I'm assuming it's a laser weapon, so maybe that makes a difference. Anyway, she's there tracking somebody named Arson Crassus, a slaver and moneylender to the Empire. Hunting him down on behalf of the New Republic, he is on Akiva, of course. And hey, fortunate for her, she's already found a decent vantage point and has him in her sights. The man makes himself no small target. He's big and round, with a beard dyed the color of deepest space a glittering robe trailing behind him like a peacock with its tail in the dirt. He clasps his hands and then takes both of them and clutches the wrist of the satrap. They laugh. Ha ha ha. Chuck, why did you say that they laughed and then wrote out their laughter? Time to end your mirth, Arson Crassus. A real person. Thought this was good dialogue. Oh god, I forgot. Okay, there. Mm. Audience participation time. Not only is Arson Crassus there, but there's a bunch of other people that are in attendance. Jazz tries explaining what one of them looks like and just this description. Then, someone she doesn't know, someone in an absurd piece of headwear. If Jazz had to describe the hat, she would suggest it looked like someone had killed an emerald kofta grouse and stuck it on his head with the lush plush purple robes of an old imperial advisor. Now, the key phrase there is Emerald Kafta Grouse. Take a moment in the comment section and type out what you think an Emerald Kafta Grouse is and what it looks like. I had no idea myself. I assumed green because emerald, but What's the shape? What's the makeup? What the hell is an emerald kofta grouse? Well, answer time. I had to look up what it was because I'm not always familiar with the way these things sound. Like there are plenty of alien species that I'm sure you could uh, mention that I wouldn't recognize. Sometimes the Star Wars references in the book are excusable and you can just look them up if you're not familiar with them. Like if you don't know what a Mon Calamari is. However, the Emerald Kofta Grouse is something Wendig made up, and the Wikipedia's entry for it only says that it's something that Wendig made up. This is incredibly useless since the animal isn't described. At best, we can assume it's green. The imagery Wendig uses for it falls flat immediately. And the only reason I figured out sort of what it was is because the Wikipedia entry has it listed as a type of bird. The context of the scene gave us nothing to work with. We had no idea 
Like, it didn't even have to be an animal. I thought it was a plant of some sort at first. That is just... Good job, Chuck. That's impressively terrible imagery. You compared a guy's hat to a thing that doesn't exist in Star Wars canon. <laughs> you idiot. Anyway, Jazz figures out who some of the other people at this meeting with uh, Crassus are, like Moff Valco Pandian and Jyla Shale. These are all big name targets in the Empire. Uh, you know, we're talking like admirals and moths and generals and such. Well, one more target is on the way as Admiral Sloan is flying into Akiva to join the others for a meeting. Pressure lives in the hinge of her jaw. Ah, who writes sentences like that? I was gonna start throwing in some of these random lines without much build up. It doesn't help. At the meeting, Sloan announces that she has uh, Wedge sedated and captured. And one of the other uh, figures, Moff Pandian, says or asks, is this who we are now? Reduced to common hostage takers? Perhaps the Galactic Empire truly is fading, like a star gone bright and then soon to dust. The Empire took plenty of hostages beforehand. Princess Leia was a hostage in the first movie. This guy's just being obtuse. Holding her is dangerous. Word of this gets out, it could generate sympathy for the rebellion in the Senate. You see, that's the kind of crap people always try to lay on me. Now she is my only link to finding their secret base. She'll die before she'll tell you anything. Refreshing. Pandian then continues on a rant and uh, brings up the Death Star by name, which always struck me as really weird for the Empire to call it that. Like, they couldn't go with something else like Space Station Stardust. They had to go with Death Star. The Death Star plans are not in the main computer. Are we the baddies? <laughs> Another interlude with Mon Mothma doing stuff. And it takes place in a on a planet called Nalal. Back on Akiva, we get another scene with Sinjir, and this time he's f being followed by the Twi'lek from the bar that showed him the hollow thingy. It's a guy named Argadomo Dakura. And uh, oh, wait till you see what this leads to. Stormtroopers spot Sinjir and the Twi'lek guy, and then they start running. And then we get a scene with Jazz, who is injured and had to crawl her way apparently to Timon's shop. I don't know why she crawled there specifically. I had forgotten, I, I'd skipped over a scene where she was spotted while she was trying to snipe the uh, figures in the meeting. A tie, like she tried to slide down a zip line to escape. TIE Fighter saw her, shot the zip line loose and she fell into a forest, you know. Not dead, but not okay. After a while, it just becomes very tedious to try to keep track of the different POV characters, as well as the different side characters, the tertiary characters, and the interlude characters. Like, if I was to compile a complete list of just all the characters, well, look at this. Anyway, since she somehow woke up in Temin's shop, it's it's indicated that she fell from the zip line, got knocked unconscious, and then woke up in the shop, even though the shop doesn't seem to be near where she fell. I don't know. Surat, the uh, gang leader, shows up and uh, starts interrogating her because he's looking for Temin. And Surat believes that Temin hired Jazz to kill him. He is a crafty little trilobite, that one. Smart, if not smart enough. He comes at you from the side, as he has done to me for the last year. Nibbling away at my business like this, like the hiss worm grubs of Celeste, chewing up our subterranean gardens, eating the roots of our underground trees. The gangster's moist face flaps tremble. You. He hired you to kill me? Well, he doesn't believe Jazz when she says that she's not here to kill Surat, so Surat captures her and drags her away, and for some reason drags her through a bar where Sinjir uh, notices her. Turns out they bumped into each other during the Battle of Endor. They just like, shared a glance and then fled. Well, apparently that heartfelt moment was enough for Sinjir to memorize her or something. 
he decides that he knows her and he's got to go rescue her because... I guess the plot has to happen somehow! We get a scene with Admiral Akbar. He does have something of a presence in this book. And he gets interrupted, like he's doing some training, some katas, and gets interrupted by an ensign who reports that Wedge hasn't reported in for a while and they think something may have happened to him. Considering that Wedge actually had a list of planets to investigate, uh, he reported after the fifth one, Akiva was the sixth on the list, and the idea is that eh, maybe we should rush in and try to, you know, investigate something, like bring bring a bunch of people there. Akbar has to argue against that, but the way it's brought up doesn't sound appealing. We have no spies in the region that we know of. I'm older, Akbar says suddenly, staring off at nothing. The reason I do this, stand here and take my car shack and continue to practice my codas, is because I wish to stay sharp, and flexible, and ahead of my enemies. I know one day that I will fail at this, and we will almost, as we almost failed over Endor. We rushed in, careless. It almost cost us everything. A moment of silence between them, his nostrils flaring. Sir? Yes, yes. Send scouts to each of these planets, but send two scouts to Akiva. Like, it's good that he has a reason not to rush in suddenly, and it's good that he's drawing from past experience but the way that it's brought up doesn't sound natural. It sounds like he's just waxing poetically for the sake of sounding poignant. If your dialogue doesn't sound natural, your readers are going to pick up on that very early. And the Ensign leaves to carry out the commands, but Akbar's got a bad feeling about everything. The, the New Republic is actually gaining ground. The Empire is losing territory and support. But, so why then can't Akbar shake the feeling that once again they are about to fall into a trap? Couldn't help yourself, could you, Chuck? Part two! Temin and Nora run away from some stormtroopers in another scene, Temin abandoning Nora eventually. Jerk move, but considering his character, it, like, I can see why he would do it. And we come back to Sinjir confronting Surat. Sinjir doesn't really have a plan as far as rescuing Jazz and just says that he's here to appeal to Surat's Limitless grace, your many-faced wisdom, your eternal might. Surat doesn't really take the bait and just taunts Sinjir in response. You have an eloquence. Manners, I like that. Even if your crooked human nose is dark with excrement. Chuck, I will sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and try to help you become a better writer. I'm looking forward to completing your training. In time, you will call me. Master. Sorot eventually gets tired of Sinjir wasting his time, so he orders his men to kill him, and then we jump scenes and eventually get to Nora trying to hide from some stormtroopers who are hunting, him, hunting her down. One of the troopers turns back toward the bay. He startles, taken by surprise, and for a moment, she doesn't know why. Look out, he starts to say, and then blaster fire pins him to the wall. The other two pivot. Blaster's up and firing, but it's too late for them, too. A speeder bike bolts in through the bay doors and drifts as, it's, uh, as it enters, its back end sliding hard and clipping the two stormtroopers in the knees. They cry out as the speeder wipes them out, knocking them to the floor. And it's Temin coming in to rescue Nora, so, you know, good on him for that. But the problem is we're just going from action scene to action scene. Like, think about how many action scenes I've described so far. I'm on page 127 right now. We need moments to calm down and collect our thoughts, allow the scene to actually open up and establish itself. If we just have constant action, it becomes exhausting. This is like if you go out for a run one day. You know, think about whatever your normal limit is, and then, you know, that, that right there might be a good uh, amount, you know, fun, get some fresh air, exercise. But what if you had to keep going? What if you had to go like 10 times what your normal limit is? That's what this book is like. That's what going through all these action scenes is like. It's, I don't really like these characters. They haven't had a chance to really establish themselves as meaningful people. You have constant action scenes broken up by meaningless interruption interlude chapters. Like, this whole thing's a mess. Nothing's allowed to actually settle. You're not allowed to gather your thoughts and really think about the weight of the situation that these characters are in. 
you've got to just slow down and settle sometimes. Figure out where you can just take a moment to breathe in and accept the atmosphere of the scene. Chuck never does this. He never really allows the characters to settle and just have casual conversations or breathe in the moment and just appreciate the setting for where they are. You need to allow these moments not just for world and character building, but because it allows the audience to catch their breath. I know the term non-stop action sounds like it's a great idea. It's actually a terrible idea because after a while you'll be really exhausted. New interlude chapter, we get someone named Young Paid and I can't recall anything about this chapter. Back at the plot, Nora takes a moment to think about how strange it is being a parent. A parent raises a child with the expectation that it's her job to teach the child how to, well, how to do everything. How to eat, live, breathe, work, play, exist. If you gotta teach the kid how to breathe, I've got bad news for you. You need to stop eating things that aren't food. And also eat less food. Thank you, Louie. You know, I never had anyone to share that kind of profound wisdom with me. It's called survival instinct, and it comes right after breathing without concentrating. Now, it may sound like Chuck is actually taking a moment to consider the characters and allow them to breathe like I just explained, but he actually does the opposite in this chapter, because on the very next page, you have Temin and Nora going down the city streets in a speeder bike, and rather than actually have dialogue, he uses prose to express dialogue between Nora and Temin. The streets are too narrow. They can take some of the main thoroughfares, yes. Whip the speeder down the CBD. Smoke every day, smoke weed every day. Or across Main 66. But the former will be choked with people, and the latter choked with vehicles and herd animals. She tries to yell at him again, trying to get him to turn back around and head toward the rainforest, but he brushes her off. Now what this does is it allows Chuck to continue an action scene, and it's a terrible idea because not just of the continuing action that I just got done explaining. Part of the magic of dialogue, it doesn't just express characters' thoughts, but the words they use, how they communicate, the, the way they use phrases elicits character as well. By reducing Nora's dialogue to prose so that she doesn't actually say anything, what he's doing is he's actually ripping character away from her and not allowing her to express herself as a character. It is another in a baffling list of decisions. I don't know why he writes like this. It's like Ernest Klein. How the hell did you become popular? They eventually have to split off. Temin goes riding down deeper into the city. Nora jumps off and, you know, they split up. Fortunately, Nora's sister, Esmel, lives in the city. So Nora stops by to visit. And then we get this really weird description of a place nearby. Describing Esmel, the narrator says, she's lost a lot of that rebellious edge since then. Now a woman content to sit in her home on Orchard Hill, as if waiting to die and join the rest of the graves that wait just up the road. Graves underneath fruiting trees, so that we may eat of those we lost and remember them, a plaque says on the gate to the orchard. I'm sorry, what? Does this place endorse cannibalism? <laughs> Five second rule! <laughs> Nora and Esmel start talking with each other, uh, kind of butting heads about how Esmel was supposed to watch over Tim, and, and we get this, like, I don't even know why Chuck does this, but... Might I remind you that you, dear Nora, took off. I thought better than to chase some fool's crusade halfway across the galaxy like you, choosing to make other people your responsibility and not your own blood-born son. And here, Esmel makes an exasperated sound. Fa! That's not prose. That's a stage direction. Also, show don't tell violation. Don't tell me the person doing that. Just have her do it. Fuck, man. Like, come on. That's... Basic! We get a scene with Sinjir and Jazz. Turns out that Sinjir was captured and he and Jazz were both thrown into cages that were uh, hung over a cliff, you know, to minimize the chances of them escaping. There are actually a couple of cages nearby. In one, a skeleton. Not human, though humanoid. Something with a horn on its head. What little skin is left on those bones looks like tattered rags and strips of rotten leather. In the other, 
It's her, the Zabrak bounty hunter. Thankfully, it's she who spoke, not the skeleton, because gross. He set himself up for a joke, and then it completely botched it. The two of them start speaking, and Jazz says that she doesn't remember ever meeting Sinjir on Endor, and he's disappointed. Disappointment pulls him down like quicksand. I thought we shared a special moment. Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And now. Well, through their conversation, Jazz reveals that the Twi'lek guy that was following Sinjir is actually dead. He died when Surat oh, opened fire and just like dragged his corpse out and disposed of it, I guess. And this isn't a setup for later on. The guy is actually dead. If he does come back later in the trilogy, it doesn't happen anywhere in this book. So his introduction, his inclusion, all completely useless. It doesn't inspire Sinjir to do anything later on. He doesn't think mournfully, oh, that poor guy, you know, like, after this chapter, that dude is never thought of again for the rest of the book. It really makes me wonder, why did Chuck include him in the first place? Because outside of, uh, f like, forcing in dialogue to characterize Sinjir, the Twilight dude whose name I don't even remember, like, actually, Sinjir makes jokes about it because he doesn't remember, like, what was his name? Orgadami? Orglagomo? Orgi Borgi? There's nothing that this guy's death really does. There was no reason for him to follow Sinjir when Sinjir started going after Surat. Uh, like, I'm not sure why he was included at all. It's, like, to show that people are gonna die? Tertiary characters who don't really have an impact outside of singular chapters doesn't count. Like, you want me to think that the stakes are high, that the characters can die Kill someone who's actually important. If you kill Redshirt37, no one's going to care. Like, I can't... I just read this dude's name. I can't remember it. Some might say that if his death had led Sinjir to some kind of inspiration, it might be a degree of fridging, which, you know, is a whole thing. But there are ways that you can kill secondary and tertiary characters in ways that actually function for the story and the characters. Now... Take James Rollins, a vastly superior and more talented author. In one chapter of Amazonia, he actually kills two tertiary characters, and they both serve a purpose. The story follows a... and I'm cutting out a lot of details and changing a few things up for spoilers, but the story follows a group of scientists who are accompanied by army rangers for protection, as they're going up the Amazon River, looking up some weird scientific marvel that was discovered recently. At one point, one of the rangers falls into the river with some um, alligator uh, with uh, caimans. There were caimans, and, you know, huge things. Well, one of the protagonists jumps in to the river to try to save him, fails in doing so, but in that moment revealed what kind of a character he is. Like, he's there to be protected, but he still jumped in to try to save another man. That's noble. That's good. I like that aspect about that character. The other character who dies uh, gets ambushed by an enemy survey group. He gets poisoned with some exotic thing that basically paralyzes him, and uh, his body is dragged away. And that shows the reader, that not only is this science group being followed and tracked, but the enemies actually have a fair understanding of about some of the local exotic toxins that could be utilized against them later on. Both of these characters are otherwise nameless, faceless people, but both of their deaths actually served a purpose. Olga Bolgo, here, whatever, here, doesn't. Like, after, outside of the frankly unnecessary dialogue with a holodeck thing he he doesn't need to be in the story i don't know why he died it's weird jazz is able to pick the lock and escape she assists sinjir and the two of them team up and head back into town in town we've got a thug named tombs who works for surat who is poking around temen's shop looking for you know whatever that case that he stole from surat and we get this line. Toombs fishes in his pocket, pulls out some numb spray. 
He gives his bruised face a couple of good mistings. Psst, psst, psst. Why the automatopoeia there? Chuck will do that occasionally and it just sounds childish. It's like, I'm not sure why he does it. I'm not sure why he does anything in this book. Well, Toombs gets jumped by Nora, who asks, where's her son? Turns out Temin got captured by Surratt and Surratt gives this very long-winded speech about how he murdered his parents and then froze his brother in carbonite. Here's why that's weird. He's the one frozen in carbonite. Some say I learned that trick from the Empire, but I assure you, they learned it from me. So the idea of freezing people in carbonite comes from Surratt, okay? Except I actually checked on this and I found an account that states that Anakin was frozen in carbonite in order to get around a blockade in the Clone Wars. Where did Anakin learn it from? This is your idea. Carbon freezing? Hey, you wanted to shield us from the lifeform scanners. Cause I don't believe Surratt was around for that. Oops. Someone more knowledgeable on Star Wars, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Surratt intends to torture information out of Temin to get his uh, supplies back, and Jazz and Sinjir decide that they need to rescue him. See, Temin is capable and should be able to repair Jazz's gun. How she knows that, I don't know, but okay. And they have to get past one of Surratt's enforcers, a big alien thing called a Herglick, a huge slimy creature. It's described as having tiny eyes and a massive head, no neck, tiny teeth and a massive maw, no chin. And despite that introduction, one paragraph later, Sinjir attempts uh, to take it on in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the alien lets go of the boy's bound wrists and grabs Sinjir with both hands. Hands big enough to tie a speeder bike into a pretzel twist. But slippery hands, too, and Sinjir slides out of the grip and quickly goes for another weak point, the monster's throat. He flips around, trying like hell to get his arms around the creature's neck, but oops, no such neck exists. This is the least professional narrator I've ever come across. Like, this is so amateurish. I've, I've seen plenty of fight scenes in fan fiction that come across as much more believable and intense than this. Fortunately, the rest of the thugs in the place are easy enough to take down. Sinjir manages to smash one's head into a wall and then curses under his breath. Bug-hugging piece of starburned flog waste. Tonight, the quality of dialogue stops mattering. That thing almost crushed my head, Temin thinks as the water gurgles past his ears. Above, storm clouds glow pregnant with lightning before discharging forked bolts across the sky. Pregnant with lightning. Pregnant with lightning. I got nothing to say to that. That's, that's, that's Chuck. Eventually, Nora shows up and, and rescues Jazz, uh, Temin, and Sinjir, and they all go back to, I believe, uh, Esmel's place. We get a scene of the meeting of the Imperial Upper Echelons, and I just can't with some of this dialogue. Pandian, pretty much Sloane's greatest adversary in these meetings, starts complaining because they're supposed to have, like, this Super Star Destroyer weapon somewhere and he whines about it. Let's not forget we still possess a super star destroyer. Isn't that right, Admiral Sloan? Or do we possess it? Perhaps only you possess it. Perhaps you're being a greedy little child who doesn't want to share her your fleet with the rest of the Academy. These are supposed to be the top brass of the Empire. This crew should be intimidating imposing like we should f find a reason to fear them to some degree because they're actually dangerous instead they're all bickering like children and none of them i mean pandian gets some degree of attention because he's opposing sloan and sloan is a pov character so we actually get inside her head but the rest of them like barely make an appearance i can't even remember any of their names i think one of them was crassus like he's the Slaver bankroller guy? Can't think of anyone else though. But this bickering is so immature, 
it's like that's not what you want in a villain like this. You want a villain done right, you gotta go with my man Admiral Thrawn. Grand Admiral, sorry. Now I've held off talking about this so far, but I know I know very little about Thrawn. I know that he is a massively respected threat within the Star Wars universe. I am this far into this book, I totally understand why. Because in the first chapter, when he's introduced in this one book, he wins a space battle. We don't get a lot of detail about the battle itself, but we understand the methodology that Thrawn uses to win. He studied the artwork of the commanding race opposing him in the battle. Because he start, studied their artwork, he understood how they were able to think, how they were able to process, and because of that, he was able to beat them. That, that is intense. That's a character you can like find intimidating and actually understand why they're in a position that they are. Grand Admiral Thrawn's a fucking badass. One chapter, not even a full chapter, explained why Thrawn was awesome and did more than what this entire book did. We're in chapter 18 now. The main protagonists, uh, Nora, Temin, uh, Jazz, and Sinjir are gathered around collecting their thoughts. Temin is worried because his attack drone, uh, droid, Mr. Bones, hasn't returned yet. Sinjir has a speech where he explains that uh, the B-1 battle droids are among the most inept fighting unit in perhaps the history of the galaxy, and trust me, stormtroopers are basically just overturned mop buckets with guns. An amusing image, I'll give Wendig that one. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. Although it does raise the question of how did Temin as a 15-year-old in some backwater town learn how to assemble a B-1 droid into a deadly killing machine. That question is never answered, I assure you. But we do have something that I will actually call good as Mr. Bones does return back. And he is far and away the best character in the entire book. The droid, painted red and black, laughs maniacally, a warped mechanized sound. It raises its one arm, the other is now missing, and all the little animal bones that dangle from it rattle and clack. I performed violence, the droid warbles. Like, that one aspect is, is hilarious. I love Mr. Bones, unironically. Negatory. Uh, no, Master. You are not a droid, however, and therefore your skills are limited by the physical capabilities of your meatbag extremities, or some such. Something to think about is that now that Mr. Bones has joined, we have all of the principal protagonists together in a room, and now the plot really starts. So far, everything has just been set up. This is where the action, like the, the protagonist team, actually starts becoming dynamic. They stop reacting and start being proactive. I am on page 200 out of 410. It took Chuck this long, 200 pages, to accomplish what Crichton could have done in under 50, and done better. But of course, the story also has to go back to Wedge, who is still occasionally in this story. Some guy named Tashu comes in to chat with him. Apparently he's a historian and uh, an advisor to Palpatine. Tashu starts taunting Wedge, and their conversation eventually leads to, I have faith in the New Republic. Tashu chuckles, and that faith will be tested. Your face will be tested when I kick you in your teeth. You know, that line could work in a certain situation with a certain character. This is neither the situation nor the character. Your overconfidence is your weakness. Your faith in your friends is yours. <laughs> faith in your mama. What was that? Another interlude on Corellia between Dengar and Mercurial Swift. They're fighting. The conversation they have is so bad. Dengar guffaws. You little scrap muncher. I was putting away bounties while you were still in your space diapers. What's it say about you that you're still in your space diapers? Don't like me much, do you? You want it point blank? You're a strange, gross old man. Heart to the moon, truth on my sleeve. Nobody's ever liked you. You know, sometimes it can take months to really get a scene just right, to get the, the dialogue right, to get the descriptive prose, to give just the right image, to have the pacing flow 
in the right way to set the right emotions. The way he writes, it's like Chuck thinks it's okay to crap out a chapter in half an afternoon and consider yourself done and never look back. I don't know, maybe he was working under some sort of a really oppressive deadline and didn't have time to actually make his story good, but... Gods, man, come on. Although, what do you think is worse, his dialogue or his prose? Like when we get one of Admiral Sloan's uh, assistants, Adea, thinking about some bad news that just happened. Bad news is, by its designation, declaratively and objectively bad. Why is this sentence in this book? Why did we need a breakdown to understand that bad news is bad? What kind of nonsense is this? Like, even if you take away the literal interpretation of it, of, you know, just stating the obvious, why is this character thinking this? If the readers understand it, you probably don't have to break it down. It's like saying rainy days are when it rains. The character goes on to think that, you know, it's the reaction that matters. People are made under duress. And, you know, okay, that's fine to think about, but... We don't need the breakdown about bad news being bad. Don't waste your reader's time. We get another character introduced uh, this late into the story. Sergeant Major John Burrell of the New Republic Special Forces, or Spec Forces, as it's called. Terrible name. I don't know if we can blame that on Chuck, though. We are also introduced to a bunch of other people whose names I'm not even going to try to pronounce because they're all going to be dead within two pages. They're part of the advanced probe team that the New Republic sent in, and all of them except for Jom die by some sort of a turbo laser. You know, Jom's able to like use a wingsuit to land mostly safely. He breaks his arm, but whatever. Jom is going to be part of an important discussion later on about how the mechanics of a story work, but more on that later. Back with Nora, we see that she's chilling out on the rooftop at her sister's place when she watches a couple uh, of aliens called Beth just chilling out on a rooftop uh, adjacent to her. One pulls out a gun and starts firing at a TIE fighter and nothing becomes of this, but Nora then notices almost as a non sequitur, that the turbo laser is firing at something, like a small black shape, it says. And she realizes that the, the shapes are actually rebel soldiers that are landing. And this moves up their timetable, which is odd because they never make contact with this guy until the very end of the book, and they don't know what they're doing. Back with something good, and I mean this, like this is actually a good scene, Temin is fixing up Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones lost his arm uh, in the last last time he was fighting, and Temin ran out of actual arms, so he has to use an astromech leg, you know, like R2-D2. This is not my arm. I know, Bones. Sorry. This is an astromech leg. No, no, I know. Astromechs are inferior. They are beeping, booping trash cans. I am made inferior by the inclusion of this non-arm. I'm not gonna lie, that actually does make me laugh. Nora tries to come up with a plan, and so she asks Tema to come upstairs and uh, says, you know, I'm glad your droid is fine. He seems to mean a lot to you. And he says, no, he doesn't. He's a droid. I'll, set, I'll be right up. Well, she leaves, and then Temin and Mr. Bones have a brief conversation. When she's gone, Temin whispers to the droid, I didn't mean that. I know you're the best. I know that too. It's like, oh my God, actually good dialogue. See, I don't know if Chuck actually learned some degree of skill this far into the book, or if I'm just getting used to his crappy writing style. Elsewhere in the house, Sinjir and Jazz are talking. He's drunk and she's trying to get him to sober up so they can actually help out with the mission that's that Nora apparently came up with. And during this, she comes up, like, she reveals her backstory. I became a bounty hunter because I did not like the life my mother had chosen for me. It felt overly arranged. It choked me. So I took after my mother's sister. Aunt Sugi was a bounty hunter, too. Thing is, Sugi always worked with a crew. She was no lone bird, no rogue operator. One thing I learned from her was, if I was going to work with a crew, I had to trust them. I had to know them. So I didn't work with a crew, because I trusted myself above anyone else. Now here I am, 
working with you. And it's weird, not only do we not really have a reason for her to trust anyone, like desperation will make them allies, sure, that works, but why trust? Why bring this up? And this is an important question to ask yourself when you're writing your character sometimes. Why do they say certain things when they do? Why do they give certain speeches? Why do they make certain decisions when they do? Is it because you need them to do that so the plot can happen? Or is it because it's natural for the characters? You should ask this of yourself as a writer multiple times throughout your story. Like, why is this character acting, saying, doing these things? There doesn't really seem to be a need for this because you can just have some degree of, you know, any old explanation like, hey, we've got a chance to really take these guys down, I'll split the money with you, which is actually something that she ends up saying because the Empire guys have, a, uh, have large bounties on their heads. But why is she giving a backstory? Why is she explaining why she doesn't work with a crew? Except now that she's working with a crew. Why does she trust Temin or Nora or Mr. Bones? Is it because it's natural or because Chuck just wanted to wedge in her backstory somehow? Don't sacrifice character for the sake of including something that you thought you had to include. If you've got to cut it, if you can't include it somehow, just get rid of it. Save it for later or save them for notes for some time later. Like, nifty backstory information about whatever you're writing. Think of the mountains of things that Tolkien couldn't fit into The Lord of the Rings. There's also a degree of tonal consistency. Falling in line with what I just said about character motivation, Nora discovers that Sinjir is a formal imperial, as a loyalty officer. And it's like, ah, she should have she should have known. You don't carry yourself like one of us, too superior, too nose at the sky. Like she actually jumps him and starts like wraps her hands around his throat. Jazz gets her to stop, but on the next page, Nora smiles and says, I have a plan. You know, she realizes that she can use him, but it doesn't sound like a sinister, no, you can be of some use to our plans, sort of a vibe that might actually have carried through. Nora not trusting Sinjir and thinking lesser of him for being an imperial, uh, imperial sure, that works. But why does she immediately forgive him and change her tone and mood? It just comes off as too convenient. Like, she, none of her sour mood is still included, and she just, I don't like it. It feels sloppy. Another in interlude with characters Hatchet, Palabar, and Greybok, the one-armed Wookiee. They're slaves on some planet, uh, Sevarkos, and we get this great setup for a great scene. See. These three are slaves, and they're participating in an uprising against the Empire, because they know that the Empire is losing ground. So they release a series of Rancors, three of them. And it's like, come on, watching these gigantic cave troll monsters stampede through a bunch of retreating Imperial soldiers and stormtroopers, that sounds awesome. Here's the fight scene. There's a very brief action scene as these three work together to like undo the cages or whatever. And then darkness takes him, though only for a moment. Or so he thinks. He opens his eyes and it feels like no time has passed at all, except it has. You put ram rancors on a stampede and then you cut out the scene, man. That is so stupid! And then those three escape, and then we get part three of the book. So Admiral Akbar is analyzing some images of Akiva because they suspect something's going on there now. And this goes back to what I said about the narrative voice not really meshing with the voice of the characters that uh, we're getting the POV from. Bleary-eyed, Admiral Akbar stands studying the data. It's a short packet of information shown in a three-dimensional display before him. The surface of the planet Akiva grows bigger, blowing up like a balloon until it seems like he could reach out and move the whirls of clouds with the flat of his hand, like a god. I don't think Akbar was really egotistical or maniacal enough to really think of himself as a god in a situation like this. Aside from the fact that it's just a holographic image, something that you'd think he'd be very used to.
You've been coming by a lot, haven't you? We skip scenes to Sloane doing her own thing as she analyzes some of the data of the uh, rebel forces, the special forces that tried landing. Most of them got destroyed by the turbo laser, and I just don't like the way that one of these guns is described. As you know, there has been an incursion into Akivan space. We discovered a rebel transport in the atmosphere above Mira. We eradicated that transport with one of the suborbital ground-to-orbit cannons. So, when somebody says that there's a surface-to-air missile to take down airplanes, they mean a missile that goes from the surface to the air. What is a suborbital ground-to-orbit cannon? Where is that positioned? Is it positioned on the ground and shoots into the orbit? Why is it suborbital? Are you talking about a ground-to-orbit cannon that's in orbit? Then it's an orbit-to-orbit -orbit cannon! That's like deploying a surface-to-air missile from a blimp! It's not surface-to-air at that point! I don't know why this bothers me so much! I'm unhinged! <laughs> so despite his over-reliance on action scenes in, the, in part one, we really haven't seen too much action in a while, which is good because it slows things down, but Chuck hasn't been utilizing his time effectively in the meantime. His problem with action scenes is that it's either over-described, under-described, or not described at all. For example, in this scene, Nora and Jazz approach Temin's workshop, which has a few stormtroopers inside. Obviously, they need to get rid of the stormtroopers so they can go inside and you know, do whatever their plan entails. And this is the action scene. Jazz nods, then steps forward, blaster drawn. Nora waits around, just in case. As the bounty hunter steps forward, the door to Temin's shop hisses open. The Zabrak steps in. The door slides shut behind her. The drilling sound stops. It's replaced by yelling. They've seen her. Then the yelling cuts short. Banging. A thud. Blaster fire. Another bang. Three more blaster shots in quick succession. Someone mewling in pain. One more shot. The mewling ends. Cut off as, uh, as fast as it began. Moments tick by. The door hisses open. Jazz stands there, a line of dark blood trickling from her nose. If I were not a consummate professional and an android, I would find this entire procedure insulting. While that's going on, Sinjir infiltrates a comms tower uh, occupied by a few stormtroopers and Imperial officers, and they say not to do anything funny, and they position themselves to assert dominance as if to say, don't get any funny ideas. Sinjir is nothing but funny ideas, so oops, sorry, too late. I cannot believe that this subpar fanfic garbage was actually published professionally. Fortunately, the scene improves dramatically as Sinjir shoots the Imperial officer in the back of the head and something metallic knocks on the door of the comms tower. The stormtroopers cry out an alarm and wheel back towards him, but for them it's too late. The door opens. Framed there in the doorway is the battle droid, Temin's droid, Bones. His astromech leg spins up like a turbine, a turbine rotor and hits one of the troopers so hard in the helmet that the white armor splits down the middle like a cracked Kukwia nut. The other cries out in panic and is silenced by a vibroblade punched through his chest plate. The stormtroopers drop. Hello, may I come in? Mr. Bones intones. I love Mr. Bones. Like, the description of the setup was terrible, but the, his line was, mm, chef's kiss. Now, the plan that Nora enacted is actually a pretty good one because they don't have the numbers to actually fight the hundreds of stormtroopers that are still on the planet, and they can't really break the security of the palace where the Empire uh, elites are holding their meeting. So they fight on a propaganda war. Temin still has his Imperial officer suit, dons that, uh, pretends like he and Temin shoot a video where he, as an Imperial officer, shoots Temin in the back as Temin is pleading for his life and running away. They then upload that, and Nora makes this big spiel about, oh, look at what the Empire is really like, they're murdering your citizens. Um, I mean, Temin's fine, he had like a blast plate or something on his back and you know, got up a moment later. The idea feels rushed, but like good enough that I'll let this slide. And even though we know it's Temin, even though we have a scene of him saying, we're in, like, we know he's alive and the whole thing was fake. 
Despite that, the following scene still feels the need to explain. The Imperial is not really an Imperial, and the dead boy is not really a dead boy. But few would even get the chance to recognize the artifice. We know it's fake. We just read that it was fake. Sinjir was the one who shot Temin, and they both stand up and upload the video so Nora can utilize it. Why are you explaining things we already know? It's, it's kind of insulting the way that Chuck writes moments like this. Like, did you think we completely blacked out the last two pages from memory? Don't talk down to your reader like they have the attention span of a goldfish. Anyway, the plan works and it inspires a riot in town, so everyone in Mira like is up in arms and starts storming the uh, palace. Pitchforks and torches throwing rocks at the walls. And while this is going on, the Imperials inside the palace realize, you know, things are getting pretty bad for us. The situation is a canister of fuel stuffed with a rag, the rag lit on fire. The rag will burn, it will burn faster than anybody likes or expects, and when it does, boom. Whoa, this sucks. Sloan then tells one of her lieutenant assistant people, begin to prepare the ships. A line that reminds me of George Carlin's old complaint about pre-boarding flights. And a quick ramble if I can, because it's just in my notes. The way Wendig utilizes sentence fragments comes off as a semi-thought-out stylistic choice. It can work in small doses or with focus on a particular character. Maybe they just think quickly or in short, choppy sentences. However, when every point-of-view character gets this treatment, it becomes less about highlighting character and more about Wendig using the same voice for all his POV characters. It makes them all too similar, and they tend to blend together. With the first Law series, using this as an example again, with the first Law series, a reader can tell which character is the point of view character just by the writing style alone, since they all have unique quirks and phrases they use. Wendig does not utilize these ideas as distinction, and everything becomes a mess because of it. We get another interlude on a planet Taurus between some guys whose names don't matter. They claim to have Darth Vader's uh, lightsaber, or laser sword, as they refer to it, and it gives a really good example of Chuck's inability to properly utilize onomatopoeia. The blade gently sways. Voom voom! I refuse to believe that this was written for adults. Like, I'm trying to hold back on the myriad insults that I could give Wendig, but god damn, he is making it difficult. Back with Timon and Sinjir, they realize that they need to escape the comms tower because, you know, it's obvious that the video leaked from there and stormtroopers could come and uh, kill them quite easily. Someone is actually trying to uh, solder their way through the door to get inside and there's no apparent way for them to get out. And I don't like the way that Chuck utilized the image uh, for their escape. Temin, because of the maps his father left him, he has a pretty good idea of like all sorts of secret passages and stuff throughout the town. All right, fine, whatever, I'll buy it. Here's how it's utilized. Temin suggests that maybe there's some sort of a hidden pa uh, uh, panel or hatch or something. Up there, through the space, a ladder. The boy was right, they climb. Temin sticks his head up through a hatch. This broad, nondescript style is what makes it so hard to follow Wendig's story. He's nonspecific when specifics would make a difference. Temin is dealing with a singular specific hatch here, but referring to it as a hatch gives a general image that doesn't really fit with what we just read. As such, it's hard for readers to connect to his writing and follow what he's talking about. If he had said, Temin sticks his head through the hatch, you get the idea because there was just the singular escape route. Again. It's just sloppy setup. But it is an escape route that leads them up to the rooftop. So he, Sinjir, and Mr. Bones all lead, lead up that way. And this gets to the moment you've all been waiting for. TIE Fighters are flying in the air. They know that the communication tower has been taken and they're coming in to attack. So Temin asks Mr. Bones to take care of this. The TIE Cannons begin shattering the other half of the roof. 
Debris sprays, fire plumes, the sound of the fighter and its guns and the explosions roars in Temin's ears. Not just his ears, he can feel it in the back of his teeth. Sinjir winces, clearly feeling it too, popping up to fire a few futile shots at the incoming fighter, and then turning to pop shots at the stormtroopers now coming up through the escape shaft. Bones shrieks, Roger, Roger! Then the battle droid jumps in the air, tucking arms and legs together, forming a cannonball, and crashing through the TIE Fighter's front windshield. The TIE wibbles and wobbles in the air, careening drunkenly across the mirror and rooftops. It zigzags, herkily jerkily out of sight. That is the dumbest line in this entire book, and that sentence is what Chuck Wendig is known for. Holy shit. Anyway, we get some more action. Most of it's serviceable as Nora jumps in a TIE fighter and uh, starts taking out other TIE fighters. Jazz had taken out one of the pilots so that she could uh, jump into the fighter in the first place. Now, Nora is an accomplished pilot, so she can fly the TIE fighter. TIE fighters are very fast and maneuverable, but the trade-off is this. The TIE is a suicide ship, isn't it? To get the speed and maneuverability, the Empire sacrificed safety and sanity in the rest of the design. The whole thing is brittle, like a bird skeleton. Doesn't even have an ejector seat. It's not just a fighter. In dire situations, it doubles as the pilot's grave. Nora does a great job of taking out the enemy fighters, except Sloan figures out that one of the fighters is actually under the control of rebel pilots or something, and so she takes the turbo laser that took down the uh, special forces guys before and opens fire on Nora. And it hits, and she realizes she's going to die. You know, she has her last thoughts. You know, I've accomplished so much. I failed my son. I failed my husband. So she decides that her death is going to mean something, and she aims the TIE fighter right for the palace uh, for the landing ring. She aims the spinning TIE right at the palace. Dead ahead is the landing ring, the shuttles, a yacht. They're lined up just right. Maybe, maybe I can take them out with me. A stray, idle thought as the palace rushes forward to greet her. I sure wish these things had an ejector seat. Pilot! Land in that assembly area! Yes, sir. And Laura hits the landing pad. The Empire are left without any kind of aerial capabilities. And it was about here that I started getting really, really, really tired of Chuck's use of sentence fragments. It works fine in an action scene, as I've gone over before. The problem is his over-reliance on it just makes the entire book tiring and repetitive. It worked, didn't it? It worked better than we even imagined. The TIE fighters destroyed the antenna at the comm station, and he feared that the message hadn't gone out long enough. But then, explosions at the palace. Nora must have succeeded. That and the doctored propaganda they sent out. It worked. The city is responding. Reacting. All that pent-up rage? The cork has popped. Everything's foaming over now. It's not just from this one moment. Not just from the occupation. The Imperials have long toyed with planets like this one. Though never formally occupying them, they impose tariffs and taxes on law-abiding establishments while letting the black markets and criminal syndicates go about their business as long as they tithe back to the Empire. Using sentence fragments occasionally to heighten an action scene can be good. It narrows perspective and can give an action scene a bit of a rush, where perspective darts all over the place and readers are kept on their toes. However, when this is the default, it loses all that unique impact. It's like when Grandma makes that type of Christmas cookie that you really like only once a year at Christmas. However, if she made a batch for you every week, it would get repetitive and you'd lose all taste for them. Sinjir, Timon, and Jazz all reconvene in a cantina and start, you know worrying about the situation. It's been a while since Nora's been back, but when Jazz enters, she uh, she confirms, your mother succeeded in her mission, but she didn't make it. Nora is gone. <laughs> Bullshit. The Imperial Summit, of course, is in chaos. Their landing pad just got destroyed. There's an angry riot going on outside the palace walls, and they've got no way to really escape. There's something I really don't like about how it's explained that they don't have, you know, a lot of forces. It's like only a few hundred stormtroopers and no more TIE fighters. So, 120 Imperials for a city of how many? Here, Shale speaks. About a million. 
Why don't we have more, Admiral? Why are we not better protected? We couldn't have this look like a total occupation. The risk was low. I am sorry. Weren't there two Star Destroyers parked outside the planet's orbit when this story started? Occupation or not, the Empire's on the retreat. Wouldn't a pair of Star Destroyers raise some sort of alarm? I mean, yeah, they left at some point. Honestly, I couldn't tell you when. I think I blanked it out. But this is like Russia parking an aircraft carrier outside of New York and everyone just thinking nothing of it. And once more, Chuck has to try to tell us how the Imperials are feeling. We get a bit about Satrap Istra, who is the basically the governor of the city who's been working with the Empire. Now it's Satrap Istra's turn to speak up. Gone is his strident, fawning obedience. Present now, a taste of venom on his tongue. His handsome, smiling face twists into a mask of desperation. I believe that Chuck writes this way, spells things out for the reader because he doesn't know how to actually convey character via dialogue and blocking. He doesn't know how to show this character uh, freaking out and worrying and desperation, so he just tells us that he's freaking out, worrying with desperation. Cause you know, that's the same thing. Now they're interlude, this time with characters we actually recognized, Han Solo and Chewie on the Millennium Falcon. They're doing something. Some sort of a mission for the uh, New Republic. I don't remember what. They come out of hyperspace and they see a planet ahead of them, Dasor, which is apparently some lawless, gang-riddled place powered by slaves. Too vile even for Solo in his younger days. Thieves he can truck with. Slaves. Well, that sets the coals in his stomach to a hot volcanic burn. Uh oh The burning you feel? It is shame. Ah! They fly by the planet and Chewie roars in protest because he knows that there are Wookiees enslaved on the planet, but, you know, they gotta stay on mission. You just stay close to the Falcon in case things go to garbage. Listen to them. They're dying, R2. Curse my metal body. I wasn't fast enough. It's all my fault. Not using profanity is perfectly fine in a book like this. I'm sure Disney wouldn't approve, but... Can you at least make it sound good? But then they get a call from an old contact of Hans who calls him old. Old? He feigns distaste. Imra, that hurts me. That hurts me right in my heart. <laughs> and then there's something with Kashyyyk and they decided to abandon their mission and they fly off for them, for Kashyyyk. It's, I don't care, the book's almost done. Uh, we get a scene with Wedge. He's managed to escape because like the power went off and the doors on his cell failed so he left and then he escaped a stormtrooper patrol via a very convenient secret passage. We then get Temin and the others sitting around mourning uh, Nora's death and this moment is so stupid that I feel I need to give you full context. Read this whole thing out just so you understand how abrupt and stupid this is. As Jazz goes on about how the mission isn't scrapped, about how they still have to do the job, all Temin can do is navigate the all too familiar feelings churning inside him like a storm-tossed sea. Anger is the king of those seas. Anger at her for leaving him and giving herself to a cause that was always more important than him. And anger at himself for being so selfish and for not making better use of the time he had with her when she was here. Anger at everybody, in fact. Anger at Sinjir and Jazz for dragging them both into this. Anger at Surat for being Surat. Anger at for the New Republic and the Galactic Empire and the sound of chair legs skidding against the door, uh, the floor. He turns as the others gasp. A woman sits down in the chair at the end of the table and pulls back the veil that obscures her face. Mom, he says, his voice small, so small. Her side is scraped up, and her face is dirty, and a little bloody too. You crashed, Jazz says. Nora shrugs. Turns out TIE Fighters have an ejector seat after all. That is not an explanation! Whoopsies. Okay, ignoring for the moment that this contradicts what was established beforehand, and just miraculously bullshits an explanation in place, even if TIE Fighters 
did have an injector seat, which doesn't make sense considering their design, but whatever for now. How was she able to deploy it in such a way that wouldn't kill her? She was spinning downwards into the ground, remember? How was the ejector seat going to actually deploy itself in a way that doesn't kill her somehow? The only explanation for that would be if it shot out the back, but you'd think that would be something noticeable. And worse than that, Chuck doesn't explain how the ejector seat works or how she somehow got out of the spin. He has answered a mystery with a mystery. Then behold! Mystery Shack! Your one-stop shop for mysteriously cheap oddities. Another interlude. Jack, the kid from the very first interlude, uh, is now 13. His dad is dead, and according to Wikipedia, Jack only appears in this chapter and the one he was introduced in, so I don't know if Disney's planning on doing something with this kid later on, but uh, looks like he's done after this. He goes to talk to some crime lord guy. Apparently he is a Kirkodian, and is referred to as the Kirk. And according to Urban Dictionary, the most reliable online dictionary there is, a Kirk is a term out of Boston that means a bullshit lie. Now, Jack is angry that the Empire murdered his father, and he's got a plan that I don't think I'm supposed to take literally, but I'm very tired of this book at this point, so I'm going to take it literally. All he says is, it's my birthday, but really, it's a present for the Empire. A cake I'm baking them. And when the power is all out, and they're fumbling around in the dark, I'm going to pop out of nowhere and put a blaster shot right in Commander Orkin Kaw's back. Then he will finally have his vengeance against the man who took his father from him. Because the battle, this war, still rages, and Coruscant is not yet won. So his plan is to jump out of a cake a la a stripper and murder a guy. Awkward? Awkward. What is going on? While Temin and the others hang back for the next part of their plan to start, Jazz notices that the riot outside of the palace has somehow created a clumsy scarecrow that looks like Darth Vader. It's an effigy and they set it on fire. That's a very productive riot. Those guys are good. See, they're waiting because Temin apparently had to go into his hidey hole nook and cubby. I'm calling it. This was written for six-year-olds. And during all this, Jazz is you know, trying to suppress that she's actually worried about the rest of the team. Because, you know, Nora narrowly escaped death, somehow, and she's worried what would happen if the rest of the mission goes foobar. She tries to ignore how that makes her feel. She tries to ignore that it makes her feel anything at all. Jazz supposedly worries about her new team and tries to convince herself that losing them wouldn't be a huge deal. She hasn't established any chemistry with any of them and has only known them for maybe a day. This is rushing character development without showing anything to support it. Legolas and Gimli was this idea done expertly. Jazz is just a 2D cutout assassin who joined a group of other 2D characters. You can't force these emotional moments onto your reader because the reader won't, uh, doesn't connect with characters artificially like this. You need to earn these moments by being indirect with your writing, not by telling the audience how they're supposed to feel via a proxy. This is also a consequence of having too many characters in the story. Now the characters who are involved in the plot don't have enough time to develop. We have seven point of view characters between Jazz, Sinjir, Nora, Temin, Akbar, Sloan, and Wedge. I suppose you could also throw Jom in there because he comes back later on, so eight. And of course, all of the interlude characters, if you want to include those. I don't, but whatever. But John does come back, as has Leia. Come on. Hello, you. You need all the attention today. John Beryl, of the Special Forces team, of whom he is the only survivor, had a mission. Get to a comm station, find a way to report in. He could hack in or force the Imperials to give it up. And now, he decides to change his orders. Time for a new target. You see, he saw the turbo cannon that killed his team, of course, and the one that shot Nora out of the sky. He wants to destroy a turbo laser instead of report in via a comm station. Well, this might sound... Leia... That's trash. Don't play with it. No. S stop. Go play with your brother. He wants to destroy a turbo cannon instead of report in via a comm station. 
While this might sound good at first, consider that the New Republic didn't know about this turbo laser. The same turbo laser that vaporized the rest of his team. Instead of warning them about it, he wants to destroy it, but could very well die in the process. Intel is incredibly important in combat, so by breaking away from his mission, Jom is making an extremely foolish decision that could very possibly result in more of his own people dying. He even admits that he could die trying, so he confirms for the reader that he is an idiot. But as for Temin and the rest of them, the plan is to use some maps of some underground caverns that have been around for a long time that... You can't play with this. This is trash. Come here. Furball. The plan is to utilize these underground caverns to sneak into the palace and take the uh, Empire by surprise. But Temin doesn't like this plan. But I gotta say, I don't like this plan. It sucks. I don't like your plan. It sucks. It sucks the fumes from a broken speeder bike. It sucks the vapor from the hindquarters of a gassy EOP. Maximum suckage. Anyway, the reason that Temin doesn't like it is because part of the pathway they would have to take would take them near an underground droid factory, which is apparently haunted. But he gets convinced because Jazz says she'll split the uh, bounty with uh, the rest of the team. And then we find out that Wedge managed to sneak through the palace and get to a comm station and send out the summons to war for the new rebellion, uh, new republic. Now, someone defending this might state that, you know, Wedge reached out to the new rebellion and told them, you know, maybe even about the turbo laser. So that frees Jom up from having to do that. Here's the problem, Jom doesn't know about Wedge. So he doesn't know that the communications have been made. So that, doesn't excuse anything. Another interlude that takes place in Feed on Naboo. We get some characters who call themselves members of the Ankle Biter Brigade, you know, they're kids who fight the Empire, and they claim they brought down a whole Imperial frigate, one resupplying the Empire's front lines. Um, this demands explanation? How are a bunch of kids gonna do that? Like, it, it's, it says that they utilize the like we get a whole page of expositional dialogue and stuff it's nonsense and very badly written <laughs> good good those who are to forge the future mustn't be concerned with trivialities and cut to the chase they apparently snuck through sewers and whatnot to uh move supplies and information for the rebels and, and you know that's fine i can accept that and that might actually make for a good story. But if you call in a tip line and the police arrest somebody, you helped with the arrest, but you didn't do the arresting. These are fundamentally different things. So I don't know if they're just like hyping themselves up or if Chuck thinks that it's possible a bunch of kids could take down an entire frigate. Before they head off on their mission, Temin and the others try to find out whatever that thing that he stole from Surat was. The idea that they've been floating since the beginning was that it was some sort of a weapon. It turns out, data cubes, he asked, that's it? It's not a weapon at all? It's not. It's something far better. Information. They go down into the catacombs and Sinjir notes that he's used to tight spaces. The Empire was not known for its roomy architecture. A statement which can be immediately brushed aside with a cursory glance at Imperial architecture in the movies. You want tight spaces? Try visiting an aircraft carrier. The doorways are so narrow that the frame actually continues and circles around a few inches on the floor. And if you're not paying attention, you will trip on them. They continue onwards and we get this sentence and if you say it out loud it makes sense it makes enough sense but if you actually see it on the page you hate it walking underneath dripping water lingering rainwater Temin assures them not like the bodily excretions of some ethorian doing his business up above there are entirely too many commas in that sentence anyway Temin is acting very secretive very secluded to the others and even though they've known him for maybe a few hours, maybe a full day, 
Uh, Sinjir notices that he's possibly up to something. Being a loyalty officer, he had some experience at reading people, so he steps back to talk to Jazz. And then we get one of the dumbest interruptions in the book outside of the actual interlude chapters. Sinjir hangs back and urges Jazz to hang back with him. What is it? She asks in a low voice. We need to talk. Hmm, she says, nodding like this was inevitable. I knew this would come. And yes, I concede. You concede what exactly? You are satisfying. I don't follow. Satisfying? I don't know what that means. I do know that it sounds awfully milk toast. Drinking a cup of protein slurry when you're truly hungry is satisfying, and yet disgusting. Jazz gives him a frustrated look. I mean that I find you capable. You interest me. And so, yes, when all this is over, we may couple. And the dialogue just doesn't get any better But um, by the end there. And Sinjir points out that eh, he's not really into women. If you're going to laugh about it, she says, suddenly stung, then you can take my invitation and stick it in your exhaust port. No, I mean, I'm not into this. This? Her scowl deepens and her teeth bare. Aliens? Women. Oh. Oh. Yes. Oh. Oh. Moments pass. The awkwardness between them is a living thing, like a cloud of flies you can't ignore no matter how hard you try. Eventually, she blurts out, you wanted to speak to me about something else apparently? That exchange was unnecessary. Now, this is something that really bothers me about certain aspects of writing. And no, it's not that Sinjir is gay. Frankly, I think it fits his character and it doesn't detract from anything. Let him be gay, there's nothing wrong with that. What I don't like is how the scene was forced in there, because it started off with Sinjir thinking that the guy who was single-handedly leading them down these dark catacombs might be up to something to him having to blurt out that he's actually gay. Just because Jazz, for some reason, out of nowhere said, yeah, when this is done, let's hook up. The problem is this scene was a cheap attempt to wedge in that Sinjir was actually gay. That's why the moment was included. That's why Jazz, out of nowhere, uh, propositioned Sinjir. There are so many better ways to actually introduce uh, a gay character and actually mention that they're gay. Mass Effect 3 did this masterfully with Steve Cortez, uh, the pilot of the, uh, uh, the shuttles. When you, one of the opening scenes where you meet him, he's down in the shuttle bay mourning the death of his husband. Commander. Sorry. Didn't see you there. This is a recording from Ferris Fields, months ago. I lost a lot of friends that day. I lost my husband. It's utilized to build character. Cortez isn't just a gay guy. He's a gay guy who's mourning the death of a loved one. It builds into who he is and why he fights. Sinjir isn't really defined by his sexuality, but, at least not in this book, but to have it tacked on like this, it feels like Chuck had to go out of his way to include this because he didn't know how to fit it in naturally in a way that didn't sound forced. If the extent of the sexuality is them proclaiming, I'm gay, once in a moment that exists out of context of the story and current conversation, like what this did, then you're not building a character, you're objectifying a gay guy. This isn't inclusion, this is breaking away from the story as if to say, I, the author, included a gay character in my story, give me accolades. Now, this isn't as bad as what uh, Klein did with Lo, the trans character in Ready Player Two, who was ancillary to the story at best, but it's still not great. Anyway, after that superfluous moment, uh, Jazz and Sinjir uh, agree that Temin might be up to something, so they agree to keep their eyes peeled. Sinjir decides to try to poke around and get some idea of what Temin might be up to, you know, use his old loyalty officer skills. And as an attempt to do that, he asks, how did he program Mr. Bones to be Mr. Bones? Temin sighs, as if this line of questioning bores him, and yet he must persevere. Bones is primed with a high-octane cocktail of programs. Some heuristic combat droid programs, some martial arts vids, the moves of some Clone Wars cyborg general, and also the body-mapped maneuvers of a troop of Lalay dancers from Ryloth. I'm sorry, did you just say that Bones is somehow programmed with material from General Grievous? How the hell 
did Temin get access to that? I, again, throw it on the pile of things that'll never be answered, but how am I supposed to believe that that happened? It's not impossible, but it demands exploration. When your references become matters of logistical happenstance, you gotta kind of expect people to ask what the hell are you talking about? Well, the group gets to the factory that's supposed to be haunted, and even though, you know, ghosts are ridiculous, uh, something is coming from inside the factory. There's a rush of footsteps coming towards them, closing in fast, and everyone decides to run. Back with Akbar, he's discussing stuff with some other New Republic people, and they're getting ready to make a move on Akiva. But since Admiral Akbar is very wary of traps and has no other personality trace beyond that, apparently, he has to warn the rest of the group. If this is the Empire, you can be sure they will not go easily, and they are overly fond of tricking us into doing what they want. Like, on one hand, the only examples I can think of that, aside from the actual it's a trap moment when they attacked the second Death Star, and when Lando betrayed Han and the group in Cloud City, I can't really think of a lot of examples of the Empire routinely tricking the Rebels to do what they want. I mean, there are probably a lot of offhand examples that people can pull from external sources and, you know, other comics and books and stuff. But on the other hand, it's like... Duh? Of course the Empire's fond of tricking the Rebels into doing what they want. It's like saying, Be careful, guys! Our enemies are fond of kicking our asses in battle! <laughs> We're back to Tim and the others running through the caves. They're not being chased by old, malfunctioning droids. It's a group of aliens called the Ugg Team. Apparently they are human-like as they are described on Wikipedia, and they're not droids, but they attach chunks of droid armor to their skin. Well, part of the plan that they had was they were going to use a box of thermal detonators to blast open a wall and sneak into the palace and, you know, start messing up the place. But because of this interruption with the Ugg team, they have to throw the detonators, like the entire box all at once, I guess, and use it to seal off a, uh, a tunnel so the Ugg team can't chase after them. That happens, it works, but all of a sudden they're without their detonators and they don't really have an apparent way to uh, sneak into the palace. You get a scene of Tatooine and this is when uh, Cobb Vanth shows up and he discovers he's helping some guy shop around inside of a Jawa sand, like giant thing. I don't know, I'm tired. That thing. And inside, he notices Mandalorian battle armor, and then buys it, and then leaves. So, hey, that's how he got it in the, sh you know, before the show. My treasure bought me more than a full water skin. It bought my freedom. Back with the story, Jom is climbing a ladder with a broken arm to take out the turbo laser. He encounters a young Imperial officer, like clearly inexperienced and nervous. And I think that Chuck forgot that Jom's arm was supposed to be broken because Jom charges the kid, knocks him into a console, uh, hurts him enough that the, uh, the officer just like kind of rolls to the ground and curls up moaning. And then, Jom takes the blaster pistol, picks up the kid, and shoves him in a foot tr uh, footlocker trunk toward the back. How did he do all of that, apparently at once, with a broken arm? How did he lift a person and hold a gun at the same time, especially after we got the detail about how hard it was for him to climb a ladder? It didn't indicate that he holstered the gun. This is why word choice is important. Do not be lazy with your descriptors. And as my example of descriptors done right, Ian McGuire's The North Water. I am absolutely enthralled with this book. This is, it's a very dark story about some very bad people that apparently they've turned into a miniseries with the BBC that I am absolutely gonna check out when I'm done with this. It's about a whaling crew in 1850s something going off to, um, the Arctic Circle to hunt whales. Now I'm gonna read an excerpt from this. It's a bit of the way into the story on page 92. Also, this is gonna get gory and gross, but as far as descriptors, I think it's marvelous. So skip to here if you don't want spoilers 
or gross stuff. So the scene is, after days of no luck, the crew has finally encountered a whale and they're putting the finishing touches and killing it. Drax, far below in the hectic mist of the killing, bears down hard on the butt of his lance and whispers out a string of gross endearments. Give me one last groan, he says. That's it, my darling. One last shudder to help me find the true place. That's it, my sweetheart. One more inch and then we're done. He leans in harder, presses, seeking out the vital organs. The lance slides in another foot. A moment later, with a final roar, the whale shoots out a plume of pure heart's blood high into the air and then tilts over lifeless onto its side with its great fin raised like a flag of surrender. The men, empurpled, reeking, drenched in the fish's steaming, exporiated gore, stand in their flimsy boats and cheer their triumph. You get a full idea of what's going on there. You get just enough descriptive words there to get a solid idea, to allow your imagination to flourish as Maguire artistically paints you this, this vivid image. The entire book is like this, like seriously, very high praise for this. It's great, it's gross, and the characters are all bastards, but it's great. Anyway, Nora and the others have to figure out how they're gonna carry through the plan and infiltrate the palace. Well, Sinjir is still with them, and as a former Imperial officer, might be able to actually talk his way through a few um, layers of security and find a way to sneak the others in. Unfortunately, stormtroopers start pouring into the caverns and corner everybody, and Nora thinks that Sinjir sold them out. They're even confronted by Admiral Sloan. You'll never get away with this, Nora says. The end of the Empire is here. The comet is coming that will smash the rest of your rule to dust. Yes, well, the comet has not struck us yet, Nora Wexley. You can't trap justice. It's an idea, a belief. Well, even the most heartfelt belief can be corroded over time. Justice is a non-corrosive metal. But metals can be melted by the heat of revenge. It's revenge, and it's best served cold. But it can be easily reheated in the microwave of evil. Well, I think your warranty is about to expire. Maybe I got an extended warranty. Warranties are invalid if you don't use the product for its intended purpose. Oh, girls, girls, you're both pretty. Can I go home now? So everybody gets captured and thrown in prison. And for some reason, they also brought Mr. Bones, who just stands there in the cell. Like, I get that they were outnumbered and all, but leaving a battle droid with them sounds like in like in really stupid video games when you get captured, thrown in jail, but they leave all of your equipment and guns on you. It just, it doesn't sound very smart. But the twist is quickly revealed as Sinjir is thrown into the cell beaten and bloodied, and it reveals Temin sold them out. You see, what had happened, somehow, off screen, is Temin found Surat, made a deal, promised to deliver Sinjir and Jazz so that he, his mother, and Mr. Bones could go free. And I guess Sarah communicated that to the Empire. My question is, when did this happen? When did Temin actually have time and incentive to do this? Because the last time he saw Surat, as we're aware, was back when he was captured by Surat, before the plan was made. I don't know what's going on. I'm just gonna castle. I don't wanna to think too much. And I'd really question what his incentive was if he made a deal like that afterwards. Like, why would he pursue Surat to make a deal that didn't make any sense? I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where it's possible I missed something, but if I did, I still think that Chuck was really clumsy in his setup. And unfortunately, uh, Temin orders Bones to try to save them when it looks like the Empire is going to double cross him and the Stormtroopers shoot Mr. Bones to ribbons thus destroying the only likable character in this entire book and ruining my investment in the rest of the climax. Temin is dragged away as the rest of the group is left to rot in the cell. Now, Temin of course feels bad about this. After all, guilt cuts through him like the vibro blade at the end of Mr. Bones's arm. Even when he's referencing his own stuff, Chuck struggles to write a decent simile. And we get another fight scene, briefly, as Temin tries to get away from the stormtroopers and it 
falls very, very flat. Temin darts his hand out, catches the lip of a small fountain pressed into the wall. He curls his fingers around the stone and pulls himself free. Both stormtroopers cry out in alarm and come after him. He stabs out a kick, catches one in the chest. The stormtrooper oofs, but captures his foot. Then the Imperial pistons a fist into Temin's stomach. The air goes out of him. An ache runs through him, down his legs, up his arms. Now, I decided to take this particular moment and actually put my money where my mouth was because Chuck's attempts at getting you invested in the fight scene is very, very weak. Like, he doesn't really utilize descriptive words or action verbs very clearly. His use of pronouns between three men fighting, he uses the word he way too much. His narrative descriptors, as far as identifying who's actually doing what, is pretty weak, so that you actually have to pause to think about who's doing any kind of action. Try this instead, using a better setup. The stormtrooper slammed his foot down, regaining his balance at once. Temin's moment of hesitation cost him as the Imperial soldier hammered a blow to the boy's gut, knocking him to his knees. He was frozen in suffocating pain as the soldier grabbed Temin by the wrist and continued dragging him down the hall. I came up with that in three minutes. But that's what you gotta do. You gotta make sure that the visuals are clear so that the reader can actually understand enough of what's going on, but still put a bit of descriptive flourish in there so that it sounds impressive. He didn't punch a, boy, a blow to the boy's gut, he hammered a blow to the boy's gut. If you actually take a moment and let your mind try to explore more interesting ways to describe things, it can really work out. But speaking of descriptors, the stormtroopers drag Temin to a roof and throw him off, but because of how badly this is described, we don't even know how high up he is. All we know is that there's an angry crowd below. Like, how high are these walls? Are they 50 feet up? That'll definitely kill him. Are they 20 feet up? He might survive that. The situation fails because you don't have a decent visual for what's going on. Like, how worried are, are we supposed to be? All stonecutters must take the leap of faith. If you survive this five-story plunge, your character will be proven. <laughs> Happy landings! <laughs> so all this while, uh, one of the rich guys, uh, Crassus, I believe, uh, he called in a yacht from off-world to come pick up the uh, Imperial elites and a number of their stormtroopers. Sloane grabs the people she can, as well as Nora, Jazz, and Sinjir, for some reason, in order to evacuate the planet. And while they're getting dragged out, Nora notices that some of the stormtroopers are going to the edge of the walls and firing indiscriminately into the crowd. Nora thinks, you only dig the Empire's grave with actions like that. If you took a shot every time you thought nobody talks like that, you'd have died of alcohol poisoning by the end of the second act of this book. Everything ends the peaceful is willing to. The geography that I stands compares you superior. You underrated my ability! Is. So the prisoners get loaded. Jazz says that Temin's a survivor. He has what it takes. If anybody will make it out of this alive, it'll be him. Which is a weird sentiment, considering that he literally betrayed them. And she has no apparent basis to say that aside from the treason. Again, when you're writing dialogue and actions for your characters, stop to think, does it make sense for this character to be saying this? And once the yacht is loaded, it starts to uh, take off. And for some reason, Temin is able to... Okay, so he survives because the crowd caught him. We still don't know how high up that fall was, but I guess it's moot at this point. Add it to the pile. He shimmies up a rain pipe or something, gets to the roof, jumps onto the yacht, as it's lifting up for some reason, and then it starts to fly into the atmosphere. And he realizes, why did I do this? I'm going to die. I mean, the wind resistance alone should knock him free of the ship, but okay, plot armor, I guess. And at this point in the story, Chuck actually starts to go back and forth between multiple scenes very quickly, which on one hand is good because it creates a sense of urgency in the reader and you think, you know, these short snippets you get from all these characters is, you know, very drastic and it creates a sense of urgency. 
I, I will actually give him credit for that. That's a good writing choice. It's just going to make it difficult to talk about because I'm going to be bouncing between multiple scenes all at once here. Sloane takes a moment to think to herself about how this entire trip has been a failure. She realizes that now, but failure cannot be the end of it. Failure has to be illuminating, an instruction manual written in scar tissue. Oh my god, I look like I, look like I have a scrotum for a face! What am I supposed to call myself, Darth Syphilis? The pilot then notices that there's something large on the hull of the ship, like a very big bird. And rather than do the normal thing and ignore it because you'll be in space in a few minutes, which will kill it, she says, I'll send some men to look into it. Which doesn't make any sense, because what happens is a stormtrooper opens a window to look outside, Temin has somehow not fallen off of the ship at altitude, grabs the stormtrooper, yanks him out of the window, and then crawls in. So the only reason he survived at all, when the normal thing would be to ignore it and let him die on his own, is because the bad guys had to interfere because Chuck had no other way to allow Temin to live. He wrote himself into a corner, and rather than do the smart thing that a good writer would have done, and backed up and set the scene again so that he didn't wind up in that corner, he pushed through, hoping that no one would notice. Good job. It also doesn't help with the tension of the moment, because I don't think that the characters, like, if you're gonna have plot armor, that ridiculously thick for your characters, I don't think they're actually going to be in danger. That ruins the stakes of the situation, and it makes everything in the climax feel hollow. <laughs> Fool! You can't kill me. I'm the main character! <laughs> I'm not reading because I'm concerned about the characters and I worry about their well-being. How are they ever going to survive this? I'm reading because at this point, like, I'm obligated to for my YouTube channel. If I didn't have to, I would have dropped this hundreds of pages ago. Anyway, back on the ground with John, he's managed to get the turbo laser working the way he wanted, targeted the yacht, and then shot it. So, John's entire contribution to the story at large was this singular point. He shot the yacht, which allows the heroes to recover, like they break out of their restraints in a little bit, and uh, they're able to fight back, all in part because there is now a gaping hole in the ship, which apparently doesn't have any force fields around it, so I'm not sure how it's going to be able to protect the interior very well, but whatever, one problem at a time. Not to worry, we are still flying half a ship. This comes down to the use of mechanics in a story. Now, your characters are going to be set up certain ways, and you're going to impose, as a writer, you're going to impose certain actions onto them. Certain decisions, certain actions, certain events are going to color in the perception or make them move in certain ways, aid them in making certain decisions. Those moments are sometimes cheapened when a character has a singular point. Jom is not a character, he's a plot device. You see, Chuck had written himself into a different corner because there was no way that Temin could have actually taken down a yacht full of stormtroopers and Imperial officers by himself and rescued the rest of his team. Enter Jom, who could have been put in retroactively with his own scenes, and he jumps on a turbo laser and just shoots the yacht, which takes out a number of stormtroopers that are chasing Temin. In the confusion, he's able to get into an air duct and free the others by crawling around inside an air duct and utilizing plot convenient air ducts that the other characters are sitting next to. It's incredibly stupid, I know, and it shouldn't work. Like, I don't think it does, but I'm tired and I want to stop. The story at large is going to have some degree of interference like this. Uh, characters are going to interact with other characters, which is going to have a kind of mechanical purpose. 
uh, character A is going to do this, which is going to influence character B to do this. This happens, therefore this happens, which leads to this, but then this, and you know, it goes on and on like that. And that's how you create a story. It's looking at the events of a story in the most bare bones way, but sometimes I think that that actually helps understand how certain things need to happen. You need point A to lead to point G. But how are you going to do that? You can't just jump from A to G. That doesn't make any sense. You know, thinking sequentially here. If you understand what a character and an event's motivation and involvement in the plot and the characters at large is, you can understand how to better service those characters and make them more believable, more realistic. Wendig just throws characters and moments in there, hoping that it's good enough, without any regard for how it fits into the story at large, which is why Jom just feels so unnatural in the story. It's why we get those awkward scenes that don't really lead anywhere. Structurally, his story is a disorganized mishmash of nonsense. The characters will occasionally change their mind or act out of character from previously established behaviors. Things will be thrown in there that don't make any sense and don't seem to influence anything like the Twilight character from before. It's an absolute mess. This, this book desperately needed multiple more drafts. Like whatever number he actually ended up on, it wasn't enough. We get a bunch of characters in another interlude scene in Cloud City. I don't know who any of them are. I don't care. Temin gets into the air ducts. The main team uh, happened to be in the same conference room that the uh, Imperial Elite are, except for Sloan, who's in the cockpit. Sloan's plan is to fly to one of the Star Destroyers, the Vigilance, and then warp speed out of there because uh, I believe at this point the Rebels have started showing up. There's a moment right here when Sloan is announcing her plan to the pilot. I don't know what Chuck was doing here. Like, look on screen, I've got this up here. Uh, she says, I have a plan, take us in, same bay, the vigilance remains and I have a plan. But why does the sentence like skip an down to a new line? I don't understand why that's in place. Like. Grammatically, he doesn't really make a mistake because you can end sentences like this in certain new paragraphs, but stylistically, I don't get it. This looks like a typo. It looks unintentional. Now, there's a lot of tension in the room as the heroes are freed and they're kind of at a standoff with the Imperial elite holding them at gunpoint, you know, figuring they'll just turn them in somehow and collect the bounties. When the yacht reaches the vigilance and crash lands, you know, hole in the ship and all. Oh, before I forget to mention, Sinjir helped Temin, like, crawl out of the maintenance tube, air draft, whatever thing. Like, it doesn't make sense for his character to do that because the last time they ran into each other, Temin betrayed the group and is the reason Sinjir got his ass kicked so thoroughly. Ugh, this book. Anyway, the rest of the protagonist team slowly get up from the uh, crash after the yacht landed hard in the uh, Star Destroyer. And even though they were wearing armor, it looks like most of the stormtroopers didn't make it. Although most of the people not wearing armor did make it. But it'll be that one. Maybe if they didn't wear armor made out of plastic. This armor's useless. Why do we even wear it? Nora notices that uh, Pandion, uh, the moth guy who was butting heads with Sloan earlier, uh, he's missing. Sloan is also missing, and there's a space battle that's occurring just outside of the Star Destroyer. And this is where Nora goes from maybe a little misguided to rather reprehensible. Nora asks Temin to go back inside the yacht to find Wedge. Hopefully he's in there somewhere. And Temin asks, Mom, what are you doing? I'm going to take one of those TIE fighters and I'm going after whoever that is. She points to the shuttle as it roars towards them, its cannons firing. She pulls the others down behind the wreckage of the yacht as the laser blasts stitch a line of craters along the docking bay floor before the shuttle races towards the exit and off into space. Nora wastes no time because there is no time to waste. She's up on her feet, hard charging toward the TIE Fighters. She hears her son calling for her, asking her not to leave, asking her not to die, telling her to let it go, but she knows she can't. She knows who she is and what she does. And this is it. 
it is time to fly once more. Now this is something that's made a little worse with the prior page because a TIE interceptor screams past the bay entrance chased by a pair of arrowhead shaped A-wings. Nora thinks, I want to be out there. Now consider what I said earlier about Temin's motivation regarding his mother that I said was going to come up later. Well, Nora's a terrible mother. Nora abandons her son once again to pilot a TIE fighter and jump into battle since it's calling her. She's kind of a bitch considering that she's willing to abandon family for the sake of her own glory, sense of adventure, wish fulfillment, whatever you want to call it. Ripley was much better than this because she was able to mix her maternal instincts and put herself at great risk to make both internal drives serve the same goal. Laura just doesn't value her son that much. He was right to despise her. In Harry Potter 7, Draco's mom, a notorious villain from an evil family, asked Harry if her son was alive, disobeying orders and lying to Voldemort for the sake of her son. She cared about her son more than obeying Magic Hitler, which was good. Nora is supposed to be a hero, and this moment is framed like a heroic sacrifice, but that's not how it plays out with the emphasis from this paragraph or in the beginning of the book. Wendig should have focused on her conflicting emotions and need to protect her son, even at the cost of her own life, but Nora is portrayed more as a thrill seeker here. This is made even worse when you consider how she opened the book by abandoning the fight to recover her long lost son. Now she's abandoning her son to take up the fight once again, pulling a 180 in her character arc. Oh, well, if you really believe in me. Also, we're gonna fight a lot. I need an adult. I am an adult. No, no, you are not. She's thoroughly unlikable by this point, and I don't think Chuck is aware of how she actually comes across. Maybe she's meant to be flawed because she's a thrill seeker more than she's a mother, which could work on a character level, but I don't think that's how we're supposed to see her. She's supposed to be the brave hero and part-time mom. This is her being a hero in spite of being a mother. So Nora jumps into a TIE fighter, reaches out to the new Republic command in the area, and IDs herself as Gold Nine. I have taken command of this TIE. Repeat, I have taken command of this TIE. Keep in mind, she apparently doesn't do anything to actually identify the TIE, so good luck not shooting her down. Aboard one of the Republic ships, you have Commander Agate, who foolishly thinks we're winning this battle, which means they're winning this war. Chuck has a child's understanding of combat and war, it seems. The idea that winning a battle is like moving up a progress bar is infantile, for lack of a better word. Which is a shame because ideas like this have been much better portrayed in other things like Star Trek Next Generation. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. On board the escaping shuttle, Pandian runs in and confronts Sloane. He tries to take control of the situation, but she reveals, You fool! You eager, egotistical fool! Grand Moff! Fa! You have so much so wrong. The Ravager is not the last weapon, nor do I even control it. There is... another. His face twitches. You don't mean. I do mean. He's not dead. But you said he was. I lied, she shrugs. Now, who are they talking about? I don't know. It's probably going to be revealed in the next book. Now, the way that this particular shuttle is apparently designed is the front half can separate from the back half. So what Sloane does is she grabs the flight stick uh, out of the pilot's grip, pushes it hard to the right, and the ship goes into a quick spin, which I'm not sure how that would work on a spaceship with artificial gravity, whatever. I'm probably overthinking it at this point, but it's never appeared to really be a thing before. Again, someone who's much more into Star Wars can actually confirm if I'm overthinking this or not. But Pandian loses his footing and falls out of the cockpit and into the back half of the shuttle. The front half detaches and goes into hyperdrive. And as that's all happening, Nora locks on her TIE's cannons and opens fire on the shuttle just as the front half goes into hyperspace. They erupt in crepuscular rays and Nora has to shield her eyes. The shuttle suddenly lifts, uh, lists left, drifting not like a ship, but rather like a piece of space debris. And she realizes late, too late, it's going to blow. And blow it does. The... <laughs> 
book in a nutshell. The entire shuttle shudders and detonates. Fire blossoms into open space. Nora tries to move the tie out of the way, jerking on the controls to maneuver hard and fast to starboard. But fire fills up her window and everything shakes. Sparks hiss up the, uh, out of the console and down on her head. And she thinks, this is it, it's over. At least I went doing what I wanted to do, ignoring her son. And then she's gone. And then we get a scene from Jakku about some guy named Corwin Ballast, and I am ignoring this because there's nothing else to really say. Part four! And then she's back! Nora cries out in the darkness! Wow, that was short-lived! I guess that TIE fighter had an ejection seat too! How lucky that she survived being blown up in space! In the middle of a space battle! With enemies all around! And no way to identify herself! And no way for her to really crawl back inside of a space safe shuttle! The layers of plot armor this woman is wearing, I swear to God. How did she survive? How did she get picked up? How is she nursed back to health? How is she brought back to uh, Rebel Republic space? Add it to the pile of questions that will not be answered. I feel your anger, master. Blind, deaf, comatose, lobotomy patient could feel my anger. Ugh. So close to the end. So she survives somehow. Temin, the rest of the crew are there. Temin hugs her, kisses her on the cheek. She gets a medal from Akbar and Wedge. Surat fled, but the rest of the gang went down. Mr. Bones was somehow rebuilt, but God only knows if they actually transferred all the programs from the last one onto this one. It's not even the same Mr. Bones, man. It's like, that's cheap. And then they run into Jum, and they all get on Jazz's ship and blast off into their next adventure. We get another interlude with Olia and Corporal Argel. Some stuff happens, nobody cares about it. And then we get the epilogue, which is Sloane on the bridge of the Ravager. She runs into some guy who apparently trained her. Is it, was it a relief to let people know like, no, it's not Thrawn. I know, it was, because it was like one of the things, and that's a, it's such an expectation that I know there's going to be people who are super bummed that he's not in there, there's going to be people who are super happy that I'm not touching Thrawn. And she reveals that the rebels showed up sooner than they should have, and she discovered that there were communications that were sent from the Ravager to the Rebellion, and that was all because this mysterious Admiral guy was training her. And at this point, I don't care. It's done, and this was stupid. This book was tremendously hollow. Like, I can understand why so many people are so critical of Chuck Wendig now. This was a terrible book. The plot took too long to start up, and when it did finally start up, it went by too quickly to actually appreciate. There were minimal stakes, because it never felt like the characters were actually in any sense of danger. Many elements didn't actually make sense when you stop to question it. How did Nora survive two explosions? How the hell did Wendig, or did Wedge, wind up on the first Star Destroyer. Why so many things? When did Temin have time to go talk to Surat so he could betray the others? And in that case, why did he do it in the first place? Why is Chuck so bad at writing? Multitudes of so many things didn't work in this book. If this is what Disney thinks works for Star Wars, no wonder so many people are up in arms about the, the sequel trilogy. Like, God, I've, I've heard things about the High Republic books that are coming out where one of the characters is a sentient rock who works as a navigator? Like, what? Oh my God, there are so many things that don't work in the slightest. And I already have the other two books uh, in the rest of this trilogy, which, God, don't make me read these. And don't worry, I got all these from a used bookstore. Support your local bookstores, kids. I, I might, return to this trilogy at some point and uh, like actually see if I can stomach to finish it but why would anyone bother reading these when there are actually good Star Wars series out there? Like read up on Thrawn, read the extended books because at least some of those have to be good considering the fan reception. Ugh, but as bad as this was it is still leagues better than what I have, for some reason, 
set my sights on for my next book. I am only 16 pages into this book, and I already have three full pages of notes, as opposed to the 22 that made up my notes for Aftermath. I said I'd go after this one a while back, I'm finally getting around to it, and oh my god, I am not enjoying it, so... Hopefully I can finish it sometime in the spring. So join me next time as I begrudgingly trudge through the evil version of Fifty Shades of Grey, better known as the Disaster Piece, 365 days. I am probably, no bullshit, going to end up shooting this book. This party's over.